Going online now. Okay, perfect. Okay, I, I'm letting access into the the hall now. So everybody, make sure your microphones. We're allowing the people to enter. Ready. Ok, iniciamos. A warm welcome from Lama team to Elmo friends and all participants. It's an honor to hold the first Elmo Lama Lifestyle Medicine Summit, a virtual meeting with leaders in the lifestyle medicine movement. They are from Europe and Latin America. Our purpose is to reduce the epidemic of chronic diseases, bringing more health and quality of life around the world. We also want to inspire healthcare professionals on this journey. Enjoy our meeting. And now I will invite the Magister Lucy for her opening welcome. Hoy es un día, perdón, voy a prender la cámara, ahora sí. Hoy es un día especial para la Latinoamérica Life Style Medicine Association, la ALMA, por la Cumbre Europea Latinoamericana. Queremos compartir con ustedes unas imágenes que proyectará el doctor Johnny de la Cruz.
A continuación tenemos el grato honor de presentar a la doctora Nancy Jovergas, decana interina de la Facultad de Medicina Humana de la Universidad Ricardo Palma, quien dirigirá unas palabras de bienvenida a nombre de la Universidad Ricardo Palma. Adelante, doctora Nancy Ho. Muchas gracias, doctora Lucy Correa. Muy buenos días a la audiencia latinoamericana y europea del evento internacional Cumbre de Medicina de Estilo de Vida Europeo 2022. Les doy mi cordial bienvenida a nombre de nuestro señor rector, el doctor Iván Rodríguez Chávez y el mío propio, así como mis cordiales saludos que me permitan en primer término saludar a las autoridades. Quiero mencionar a la doctora Estefanía Ubaldi, presidenta de la Organización Europea de Medicina de Estilos de Vida. Mencionar al doctor Johnny de la Cruz, presidente de la Asociación Latinoamericana de Medicina de Estilos de Vida. Al, a la doctora Marcela Manusa, presidenta de la Sociedad Argentina de Medicina de Estilos de Vida. Al doctor Marco Albuja, presidente de la Sociedad Ecuatoriana de Medicina del Estilo de Vida, presidente del Colegio Mexicano de Medicina de Estilo de Vida, el doctor, el doctor Luyón Flores, con, que, sin la, si consigue, que considerando su, no hubiera sido posible, ¿no?, su, en la realización, la cristalización de este evento. Nos, eh, igualmente quisiera agradecer a, a los médicos, a los, asist, a los mm, residentes, a los estudiantes de 13 países de Latinoamérica, desde México hasta Argentina y Brasil y aquellos invitados de Europa, que engrandecen este evento internacional. Con este evento nos enfrentamos a dar una visión a la salud pública basada en la, en, basada en la prevención de enfermedades crónicas que a través de la medicina de estilo de vida brindamos su tratamiento. Les ofrecemos también temas que servirán para la práctica de todos los profesionales de la, de la salud y queremos por supuesto con el tema de medicina de estilos de vida y que eh, este tema tan importante llene las expectativas de todos los participantes. Agradecemos su participación en nombre de toda nuestra universidad que quería concluir diciendo que esta es una organización coordinada entre la Universidad eh, Ricardo Palma, con la Facultad de Medicina y su Instituto de Investigaciones en, 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 en Ciencias Biomédicas. ¿no? También tenemos la Organización eh, de, de Medicina Europea de Estilos de Vida y la Asociación de Medicina Latinoamericana de Estilos de Vida. Gracias a todos ellos por permitirnos ofrecerles este el, el buen curso o buen evento internacional, deseando toda clase de éxito y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctora Nancy Ho, por sus palabras, por la bienvenida que nos ha dado. Entonces, en este momento pasamos con la presentación de, que va a dar el doctor Naum García. Adelante, doctor Naum García. Muy buenos días, estimados amigos de Latinoamérica, de Europa y de otras latitudes. Es un placer para mí saludarlos desde la Universidad de Montemorelos en el norte de México. Y es un gran honor presentar a nuestro primer ponente de esta mañana, quien ha sido un verdadero pionero en la medicina del estilo de vida en Europa y en otras latitudes. Se trata del do doctor Joannis Arcadianos. Él ha sido vicepresidente 
y fundador de la Asociación o Organización Europea de Medicina del Estilo de Vida. Además, está certificado por la Federación Mundial de Obesidad. En su experiencia como vicepresidente y cofundador de la Asociación Europea de Medicina del Estilo de Vida, él ha presentado más de 100 conferencias con los temas que tienen que ver con nutrición, obesidad, nutrigenómica. Él es graduado de la Escuela de Medicina de la Universidad de Atenas y está certificado en Medicina General con estudios de posgrado en las áreas que mencioné. Como les decía, es un pionero de la medicina del estilo de vida en Europa, más de 30 años practicando. Y actualmente él tiene una certificación SCOP, el Centro Estratégico para Educación Profesional de la Obesidad de la Federación Mundial de Obesidad. Es miembro también del Consejo de la eh, Iniciativa de Salud Verdadera y es presidente del Consejo de la Asociación Médica de Grecia para la Obesidad. Es un gusto tenerlo con la conferencia que hoy tendremos, muy importante, por parte del doctor Arcadianos, acerca de la dieta mediterránea en esta lucha contra la obesidad. Bienvenido, doctor Arcadianos. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to, to speak to, the, to this admit. It's a very important event for our organizations, your organization and our organization. And I'm going to talk, I'm sharing my screen first. I'm talk about Mediterranean diet as an important tool in the fight against obesity. I'm living in a country that it's in the heart of the Mediterranean and uh, Greece, it's a place that all people try to eat this way. But the problem is that not all of them are following this diet. So what we'll see, it will be definition and historical points regarding the Mediterranean diet. Some characteristics. The Mediterranean lifestyle, because it's not only diet, the Mediterranean diet. We have the lifestyle, Mediterranean lifestyle. About obesity, I'm going to talk. And finally, a case study of a patient of mine that we'll see that is very impressive. The Mediterranean diet is defined as a traditional diet pattern found in the population living in the Mediterranean base especially in Italy and Greece during the 80s, 60s, and 20th century. This is the Mediterranean Sea. If you see there are a lot of countries, including Greece, of course, Italy, Spain, but also Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Lebanon, Israel. This is the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, but the, the way that all these countries eat, are eating, is not the same. What happens in our days? The interest in the Mediterranean diet began in the 60s with the observation that coronary heart disease caused fewer deaths in Mediterranean countries, such as Greece and Italy, than in the US and Northern Europe. Subsequent studies have found that the Mediterranean diet is associated with reduced risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The Mediterranean diet represents a more general dietary model in nutritional epidemiology that has been extensively studied, especially over the last two decades. The Mediterranean diet is one of the health eating plans recommended by Americans for health promotion and chronic disease prevention. It is also recognized by the World Health Organization as a healthy and sustainable diet and as a cultural asset by the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Let's see the characteristics of Mediterranean diet. 
here is the first parameter, and this is the last one from old ways. And if you see, the model is about the same, but in the new parameter, there are also the Mediterranean lifestyle, socialization, uh, friends, exercise. I'm going to talk for this afterwards. What's the basic characteristics? It's low consumption of meat and meat products with very low consumption of red meat, beef, pork, and lamb, consumed only in special cases. Very low zero consumption of proceed meat, better ice cream, or other full fat dairy products. Only ferment dairy products, cheese, and yogurt are consumed in moderation. An important source of protein is the moderate consumption of fish and shellfish, which was variably depending on the proximity to the sea. It has a relatively high fat profile due to the abundant consumption of olive oil, combined with a high consumption of slightly proceeded locally grown vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, and cereals, mainly raw. The main sources of fat and high alcohol among individuals in the traditional Mediterranean diet are mainly extra virgin olive oil and red wine, respectively. And finally, the abundant use of olive oil through salads, traditional cooked vegetables and legumes, as well as the moderate consumption of red wine during meals, makes this diet extremely nutritious and enjoyable. Olive oil. It has Anti-atherogenic properties of olive oil are due to its high content of monounsaturated fats. Extra virgin olive oil is the product from the first pressing of the ripe olive fruit and contains many antioxidants, polyphenols, tocopherols, and phytosterols. And lower quality olive oils, refined or common olive oils, are believed to lack most of these antioxidants because they are obtained by natural and chemical process that retain fat but lead to the loss of the most bioactive elements as above. Red wine and extra virgin olive oil contain several bioactive polyphenols, hydroxytyrosol and tyrosol, olander and erastrol with reliable and inflammatory properties. What about fruits and vegetables that very, very in high uh, uh, qualities and uh, very good qualities and very high here consumption in our areas? There is significant evidence that a diet rich in fruits and vegetables may reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. Numerous modern studies confirm the above. And the Mediterranean diet is based on the consumption of large amounts of fruits and vegetables, as I told you. Fruits and vegetables, base ingredients of the Mediterranean diet, are rich sources of antioxidants and other ingredients that help lower cholesterol and protect blood vessels. Some examples. Apricots. It's high in B-carotene that helps in health protection, heart health protection. Watermelon, a good source of lycopene, which is a powerful antioxidant. Tomatoes, the best source of lycopene against the ac accumulation of cholesterol in the walls of blood vessels. Carrots, B carotene, a powerful antioxidant. Grapes, contain pectin, contribute to better cholesterol levels. And asparagus, contain as ingredients the sapo, saponids that have anti-inflammatory properties. An example of a salad, eggplant salad, how axiodia capacity it has. If you see the eggplant has thousands of antioxidant radical capacity, also onion, garlic, parsley, vinegar, and of course the extra virgin olive oil. So, totally it's 2,350 total antioxidant capacity, just for one salad. Mediterranean diet reduced the risk of death. A very large meta-analysis of clinical trials of about uh, half a million participants found that higher fruit and vegetables intake 
was associated with a reduced risk of dying from cardiovascular disease with an average re reduction of 4% for each additional serving of food and vegetables per day. That's very important. For one serve, we deduce the death for 4%. This is a research published in the uh, British Medical Journal. And a very important and a cornerstone as a publication from Antonia Trikopoulou that she was the keynote speaker in the second ELMO Congress in Rome. It has to do with Mediterranean diet and survival in the Greek population. About 22,000 adults in Greece were participated. The follow-up was 44 months, and there were 275 deaths during this period. The study showed that a higher degree of adherence to Mediterranean diet was associated with a decreased coronary heart disease at just mortality rate 0.67. Total mortality is at just mortality rate 0.75. And cancer at just mortality rate 0.76. What is the score? It was the score between zero and nine with excellent the 10 in Mediterranean diet scale. Mediterranean diet almost every year is the best diet in the world according to US news. It was also the, the best diet for this year. Is ranked number one in best diet overall. Number one in best plant-based diet. Number one in easy diets to follow. Very important for someone who is trying to eat well. Number one in best diet for healthy eating. One best diet for diabetes diets. And one best diet for health, heart healthy diets. But we don't have only Mediterranean diet. We have the Mediterranean lifestyle. That is, physical activity in the context of daily family and community life. A sleep pattern that allows for adequate rest, including a short mid-day siesta, mid-day siesta. Social participation, social ties, stress control. And living in sick, promoting a way of life, diet, transportation with low environmental impact. I'm going to talk about obesity because obesity has to do with diet and it's something that is very, very uh, bad for our days as a, as a disease. It's an epidemic disease. What's the fact? The fact is that 800 million people are living with obesity globally now. The impact of obesity, sorry, will cost 1 trillion by 2025. Childhood obesity is expected to increase by 60% in the next 10 years, reaching 250 million by 2030. People living with obesity are twice likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19. Obesity is a pathological condition described by excessive weight gain and fat. When taken in a chronic form, it can lead to serious health problems. It's a lifestyle-related disease, and it has a code in ICD-10 E66 as a disease. In May 2017, the World Obesity Federation released a position statement in the journal Obesity Reviews, recognizing obesity as a chronic, relapsing, progressive disease process. We have three stages of this disease, obesity. Class one, low risk, with BMI between 30 to 35. Class two, moderate risk, with 35 to 40. And 
the high risk obesity plus three BMI more than 40. I like these slides because it shows all the complications of obesity, of obesity in all body. If you can see cancer, some cancers associated with obesity, phlebitis also, skin, good, no alcoholic fatty lab, liver disease, gallbladder disease, a lot of gynecological abnormalities, of course, coronary heart disease, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, all the internal medicine has to do with obesity. And that's impressive because a lot of people don't know that these all are due to obesity. What happens in obesity worldwide? If you see your region, our region has a lot of people suffering from this disease. The red is the high, uh, high levels of obesity. Of course, North America and some countries like Australia and Middle East has a lot of problem, but also all Europe and almost all Latin America has this problem. And if we have a look at this publication in Lasset regarding the global obesity rates among men and women from 1975 to 2014, this has doubled at, at three times more is the, the rate. What happened all these years? We changed our lifestyle. Some factors affecting body weight. It's the genes. Although the FF effect is relatively small and heredity is not density. Influence on prenatal and early life. Poor quality and a healthy diet. Of course, is the major problem, the bad diets regarding obesity. Excessive sitting life, TV and screen time. Very little physical activity and sleep. And toxin environment, food and physical activity. All this has to do with lifestyle medicine, if you see, if you have a look. And the source is Harvard School of Public Health. And I'm going to show you a very, very interesting case study from my clinic. I'm um, treating obese people for about 30 years. I have seen thousands of patients, but this one is one of the best examples as case. It's a man, date of birth, 1973. First visit in my clinic, June 2000. 15, uh, he was uh, 13 years old. Look at his height, 1.86, uh, weighs 204 kilograms, BMI it's 59 with a lot of fat, or almost half of his body is fat, was fat. As history, mild hypertension, fatty liver and infiltration, no smoker, as family history, both parents obese. The environment was obesity. Father, diabetes type 2 and coronary heart disease. And medication for the mild hypertension. If we see his blood exams, it's not bad. Insulin in high levels, TSH, and the others, except folic acid, very well for this high, very high weight. How I'm treating, how, how I'm approaching these patients. The first is the nutrition consulting, and I'm following the Mediterranean diet model. Recommendation for mild physical activity. Of course, physiological support. I give to him a big complex supplement so that to increase the folic acid, a multivitamin, and weekly follow-up. This is 
a key for a good success for, from, for this kind of patients, the weekly follow-up, or live or virtual now due to the COVID. And this is the process. If you remember, it was 204 kilos. After three months, he had lost about 30 kilos. BMI from 59, 54. After one year, he had lost 50 kilos. After two years, we're talking about 75 kilos. After four years, eh, sorry, three years, about 90 kilos. And that's the impressive that he become a, a good BMI with a good, a good BMI. 32, and she's keep his, sorry, she, he's keeping his weight after four years. That's the success of this case, to keep the weight after losing about 100 kilo. He was very dangerous for heart disease, for diabetes, for everything that associated with obesity. But now, and you see the recent measurement in my clinic, he keeps his loss with good diet, Mediterranean model diet, physical activity and stress management. That is the, the, the med lifestyle medicine approach for, for these kinds of patients. And I have hundreds, thousands like him. Not so fat, but with problems of obesity, of course. And if you see the blood exams, the insulin that it was the high levels after one year after, it was less than mine. Also, folic acid increase and TSH became better. That's the patient, Costas. And now, and he's keeping his lost. That's the important. So, some conclusions. The Mediterranean diet is a nutrition model that could be used to better health and disease prevention, including obesity. It's not only a diet model, but also a way of living, lifestyle, and can be followed all over the world. Lifestyle-related disease, including obesity, are the leading cause of death and disability on the planet today. Lifestyle factors are the main drivers in the pathogenesis of a chronic disease. Nutrition is a very important factor in lifestyle, as it's a daily routine contributes depending on the species to the manifestation of prevention of chronic diseases. The Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean lifestyle should be an option for better health. Simply daily, daily habits that contribute to a better health are quality and quality of life. This is the Mediterranean lifestyle. Let's follow it. Lastly, I would like to invite you as president of the organizing committee in the fourth ELMO Congress, which will be held live in Athens. After three years, it will be a live event of our organization. There you will have the opportunity to visit the homeland of Hippocrates and experience the Mediterranean lifestyle, not only the diet, but the lifestyle and the sun, of course. I'm looking forward to meeting you in Athens in October. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I don't know. Dr. Naun Garcia. Doctor Naum García, para coordinar las preguntas que existan. I would like to ask you what the percentage of the burden of obesity can be attributed to genes. It's a question from uh, 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 Lujan for Flores. Uh, genes is not our density. Uh, 
the lifestyle plays the key role. Is for me is the the ninety percent, maybe more. If you have a good lifestyle, good nutrition, exercise, you can keep your weight in a good uh, level. Of course, the genes play a role, but we can be against our against our genes with our lifestyle. There are also some questions in uh, in Latin. I cannot understand. Sorry. Doctor, we have one question. Do you recommend red wine to have polyphenols in our diet? It depends on the situation. If the patient has problems with liver or uh, fatty liver, it's only for special occasions, not every day. But yes, red wine and white wine, but the red is better, of course. It's uh, the Mediterranean way of living. Perfect, thank you. We don't have any more questions. Uh, we do have one. Based on your experience, what do you tell other health professionals who say that people are not willing to change their lifestyle? Huh. Uh, must see each case as individual. You have to approach the patients one by one and be inside of them so that to see the problems that it's up behind. That's the point. Must see the why, what, why, what happens, why happens this, and then what to do. That's one of my basics as a, a, a method. I see first the patient one by one with their problem, with their medical problem, blood exams, and then I treat obesity. Thank you, doctor. I'm afraid of toxic agriculture to recommend for our patients. What's, what we should do? Um, toxic agriculture, okay. <laughs> of course, uh, I don't know how all these that we eat are produced, but we have to, to take care and to try to to eat what we think that's more good for us, not so bad as as the production. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Banya? And what about the studies in the epigenetic clock and biological age with Mediterranean lifestyle? Oh, there are places in Mediterranean that the people live uh, until a uh, hundred years. Uh, there are in Greece also. And uh, I think that if we change our lifestyle, this is not going to happen in the future. Must keep eating well, must exercise, must control our stress. And I think that we can go better. Thank you very much all. I think that we can go on with the next. Yes, thank you, Dr. Arcadianos for your presentation. If we have any further questions, they can be sent in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much all, I think that we can go on with the next. Thank you very much, Dr. Arcadianus. En estos momentos pasaremos también a la presentación. Yes, thank you, Dr. Arcadianus, for your presentation. If we thank have you. Any... Uh, one note, Jason, please. Uh, maybe tell to the audience that uh, there is a translation. If the speeches will be in uh, Spanish, that, that there will be translation because I had some. Uh, 
questions. What about the language of the of the speeches? So I must tell the audience that there is the option of uh, interpretation. No? Of course, we will through the chat. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all. In este momento, vamos a dar pase a la doctora Rocío Guillén Ponce, quien nos va a presentar. Adelante, doctora. Muy buenos días, ¿cómo están? Acá desde la Universidad Ricardo Palma, de la ciudad de Lima, estamos eh, presentando con mucho gusto este, esta cumbre que tenemos de estilos de vida. Quiero presentar el día de hoy a nuestro querido y gran doctor Johnny Alberto de la Cruz Vargas, quien es graduado de médico especialista en oncología médica en la Universidad Nacional de La Plata, Argentina. Asimismo, tiene una maestría en investigación clínica, Universidad Autónoma del Estado de México. Presenta un doctorado en medicina, Universidad Nacional de La Plata, Argentina y es también director del Instituto de Investigación de Ciencias Biomédicas de la Universidad Ricardo Palma. Es presidente de la Asociación Latinoamericana de Medicina de Estilo de Vida y editor y director de la revista científica de la, de la Facultad de Medicina Humana de la Universidad Ricardo Palma, indexada en Cielo. Es embajador de la Organización Europea de Medicina de Estilo de Vida y es fundador y director de la Cátedra de Medicina de Estilo de Vida de la Universidad Ricardo Palma, director y programa internacional de especialización en medicina del estilo de vida. Y otros cargos más que desempeña el doctor. Doctor Johnny, muy buenos días. Le dejamos con su ponencia el día de hoy. Thank you. Yo no lo escucho a Johnny. ¿Cómo le hago? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very glad to present Dr. Johnny De La Cruz, the current Lama president. Uh, if you just give us a minute here. Thank you very much, Dr. Aguillén from Universidad Ricardo Palma. At this time, we want to ask Dr. Stephanie Ovaldi to please present for us a special message. Dr. Stephanie Ubaldi, uh, we, we will listen now from the president of ELMO, some words. Hi, this is Stefania Baldi and I'm the president of ELMO, the European Lifestyle Medicine Organization. ELMO provides leadership in Europe in lifestyle medicine. We look forward to welcoming you as new members. So join us, join ELMO, and become a pioneer in lifestyle medicine in Europe. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephanie Ubaldi, for the invitation to ELMO Congress. Let's begin. Lifestyle medicine and breast cancer prevention. The topic for today is the importance, the importance of cancer prevention and, and lifestyle medicine.
we can we can see this from a perspective of lifestyle medicine and and you can clearly see that prevention is the importance in lifestyle medicine lifestyle medicine is uh, one of the strongest pillars for prevention of breast cancer obviously there's early early diagnosis the actual treatment of the cancer the the time or the survival rate based on the diagnostic and obviously how much time during the disease free survival or the progression that's one of the many strengths of lifestyle medicine today we're going to talk or focus on prevention of cancer the During the last years, what we have seen, we have seen three types of transition. You may know them perfectly well. Demographic change. And then we have seen the third transition, which Dr. Arcadianos talked about. And the importance of the Mediterranean diet or the nutritional transition. During the last years, we have seen this nutritional be present in all of the different types of cancer. Recently, the World Cancer Report was published by the World Health Organization. So let's look at what is the evidence, I echo. So what is uh, the possible solutions based on the evidence? This is a European Journal of Cancer Prevention and the Annals of Oncology. We, we talk about the lifestyle factors crucial to cancer prevention. This is one of the top uh, oncology journals in the world. This title uh, called to my attention, Today's Lifestyles, Tomorrow's Cancers. The tendencies of lifestyle for cancer, especially in low socioeconomic uh, countries and developed, underdeveloped areas. Speaking about challenges and opportunities for primary cancer prevention are all about lifestyle. In the American Journal of Epidemiology, for Oxford, population attributable risk of modifiable and non-modifiable breast cancer risk. Factors in postmenopausal breast cancer. This study uh, was taken, undertaken from 1976 to 2010, over 120,000 mm, women were studied in the nurses health study in a total of over 8,000 cases over 2 million person years. When we look at the non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors, we look at age, age at menage height, age at first birth, body mass index at age 18, family history of breast cancer, and obviously prior uh, benign breast disease. But what we're trying to look at when we talk about lifestyle, we're looking at modifiable risk factors like weight change, alcohol consumption, physical activity levels, was there breastfeeding or not, and obviously menopausal hormone therapy. So the attributable fraction, we look at over 70%. And modifiable risk factors, we look at 35%. Obviously, this shows a great window of opportunity to act. Some of the conclusions or the summary shows that cancer is an ever-growing global uh, health burden. 
it's much more complex to treat than other non-transmissible diseases. Even with maximal prevention, many cancers will still need treatment. Those are the non-modifiable and unknown risk factors. Some of the greatest global inequities exist for cancer treatment. And a cancer prevented does not need to be, does not need to be treated. I wanna point out that any prevention is worth, as we know, uh, a pound of cure. And prevention needs to be obviously at the heart of any national or global cancer control programs. I think this is very important to point out. The decision makers in the government, all prevention programs should be part of the initial primary health programs in a country. So let's talk about the global burden of disease and the global burden of cancer. Global CAN in 2008 pointed out there that in that year there was 18 million new cases of cancer. Of those, almost 10 million deaths. You can clearly see the magnitude of, of and the mortality or the lethality of cancer. There is now a statistic that shows that one in eight men and one in six women will be diagnosed with cancer. And when we look specifically at breast cancer statistics, we're looking at 2.3 million women in the world in 2020, 2020, 2.3 million women were diagnosed with breast cancer. Of those, over 680,000 women perished. It was a 76% survival. It all depends on country to country statistics. For example, in the United Kingdom, uh, it was over 75% survival, but Latin America may be between 50 and 60%. And preventable cases are one in four women can, almost 25% can be prevented and treated. This is breast cancer map from all the world. These are the cases, adjusted uh, rates. And this is the mortality in the, in the crimson or reddish colors. So you can clearly see between Latin American and the Caribbean and Europe, you can see 210,000 women, new breast cancer cases in Europe, 531,000 new cases for Europe in 2020. So, so Latin America and Europe have quite a, an impact in breast cancer rates. In my country, in Peru, in 2018, we published with the Ministry of Health this analysis of the actual cancer statistics in the country. This is Dr. Willy Ramos, which is the original author of the study. And we saw a tendency from 2007 up until 2018. And these are premature mortality rates attributed to cancer. And you can see the different provinces of Peru. The highest rates are toward the northeastern part of the country. And this is according to lifestyle. By 2030, we have... A, new studies that show that there will be a 50% rate of incidence. And obviously this has to do with uh, uh, the aging of the population, low effectivity of cancer prevention programs, and obviously lifestyle medicine will be a big factor. Dr. Arcadianos mentioned this topic of nutrition and even from the father of medicine, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. Recently in lifestyle medicine, we have seen that these benefits are readily available in a variety of whole plant-based foods that can help to fight cancer or even prevent it. In Journal of Internal Medicine, Many of us have seen this image before. We have seen longevity that is associated with four characteristics. And you can clearly see here that the more of these habits you follow, the higher your longevity rate is. 
not smoking, 150 minutes of physical activity. And you see clearly there, uh, a healthy body weight and the Mediterranean diet. So we know that specifically tobacco in Europe is a, is a huge uh, health concern and a huge problem. When we look at these four habits uh, put together or in, in conjunction, you see clearly that the number of healthy behaviors and their hazard ratio significantly goes up or down. Diabetes, MI, and cancer. We wanna remind everyone that chronic inflammation is at the root of most of these non-transmissible diseases. The American Society of Clinical Oncology recently published in their textbook, Lifestyle Modifications and Policy Implications for Primary and Secondary Cancer Prevention. And specifically diet, exercise, uh, safe sun exposure and alcohol consumption reduction. So here are the main points to take away from this chapter. You can clearly see there the guidelines of adopting a physically active lifestyle, consuming a healthy diet, and achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. Even in postmenopausal women, this is very important to maintain their weight. And we talked about the 150 as the number or the target for physical activity, preferably 30 minutes a day or 75 minutes of of high or moderate intensity physical activity. Yes, go ahead, doctor, we see your presentation. We, we don't see anything. Your screen is clear to us, doctor. Go ahead. Yes. Just a quick moment here. Yes, we see your screen. As I was saying, adopting a healthy and active lifestyle is key in cancer prevention or even cancer treatment. Practical applications or takeaways from this American Society of Clinical Oncology. Lifestyle behavior plays a substantial role in reducing cancer incidence, comorbidity, and survival. That's such a powerful statement. This is fundamental when we talk about lifestyle medicine and prevention. As such, clinicians should routinely evaluate lifestyle behaviors and promote healthy lifestyle to reduce this cancer burden. I just wanna quickly look at diet, physical activity, obesity and cancer within the biological mechanisms by which uh, cells are programmed and even react. Uh, we see certain physiological processes like inflammation, DNA repair, hormone regulation. This meta-analysis, which evaluates the associations between alcohol consumption and risk of cancer and different sites of cancer, diverse tumors. Non-drinkers have a, a neutral risk or, or relative risk, but you can clearly see how breast cancer, even in a light drinker, clearly goes up to 1.04. A moderate drinker, which is two to four drinks per day, jumps up to 1.23, and this goes up to 1.61 for heavy drinkers. Conclusions from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, primary cancer prevention is possible. Primary cancer prevention is possible through potentially modifiable lifestyle changes. 
these recommendations have been published by different agencies and associations around the world about lifestyle modifications. And we can clearly apply this to cancer sites and different tumors such as breast cancer. Lifestyle medicine and cancer pathways that have been proposed in lifestyle medicine practice and in research. We talked about inflammation, lipotoxicity, angiogenesis, glycosylation, advanced glycosylation, the microbiome. So when we talk about lifestyle medicine and breast cancer prevention, we want to be clear that the two go hand in hand. You cannot separate the two. The role of diet and lifestyle in breast cancer is very powerful. We have seen a, a plethora of research in the recent years. We're looking at one now in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine and the breast cancer, a lifestyle medicine approach. In the United States, 40% of all cases could be prevented through health-related choices. In other words, lifestyle modification. This is from the World Cancer Research Fund and American Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, their suggestions in the form of recommendations for cancer prevention. So you can clearly see there the lifestyle choices such as limiting fast foods or ultra processed foods, a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans, plant-based, physical activity, healthy weight, and limiting consumption of red and processed meats. And a big, uh, a big recommendation nowadays is the consumption of, of processed sugars and especially sugar sweetened beverages. Alcohol consumption, as we have seen in the previous studies, those, those, are the, those are the greatest recommendations based on lifestyle. This uh, recent publishment from uh, Future Medicine and Breast Cancer Management talks about the effects of major lifestyle factors on breast cancer risk. What is the impact of weight, nutrition, physical activity, tobacco use, and alcohol? So you can clearly see the lifestyle factors like alcohol consumption, tobacco use, even passive smoking and nicotine products. We look at uh, overweight and obesity. There is a comparison between the Western diet and the Mediterranean diet. And obviously a diet high in saturated fats or, or a diet high in fiber. So let's look at what some of the conclusions were. In that context, healthy lifestyle is associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer, especially in postmenopausal women. And more than 50% of breast cancer cases are preventable. Some of what Dr. Arcadiano shared regarding the Mediterranean diet, we saw in the journal, the JAMA Internal Medicine Research, Mediterranean diet and invasive breast cancer risk among women at high cardiovascular risk in the pre, the pre, the PREDIMED trial. This was a randomized controlled trial that showed an effect of long-term dietary prevention and breast cancer risk. And this was what, what some of the research showed. A, a standard diet, the incidence of invasive breast cancer on the vertical column, the, the control diet was the highest incidence. There was no changes. The second diet was a Mediterranean diet with, with nut consumption. And the last one was mid diet plus extra urgent olive oil. That was the lowest risk, obviously. There's very interesting research regarding a randomized control trial and Mediterranean diet. Another study from the EPIC trial, the health risk, healthy lifestyle and risk of cancer in the European uh, prospective cohort. Uh, 
And you can clearly see the mm, three, four, and all the values that were stipulated. You can clearly see that the attributable fraction risk was reduced when lifestyle was adopted. And the conclusion is when we, when we looked at the lifestyle index, which included a, a healthy diet, physical activity, a reduction of tobacco and alcohol use, and there was a significant reduction of cancer in men and women, which shows a protective relationship or effect with this population. We know that cancer is a multifactorial and complex uh, malady. However, the, these, these findings in different populations around the world certainly give us hope that lifestyle medicine has a huge impact on the prevention or treatment of cancer. This uh, recent article published in Cancer Prevention Research in the Women's Health Initiative cohort shows that a lifestyle in postmenopausal women shows a significant risk reduction when following a healthy lifestyle. This healthy lifestyle, uh, women's healthy index looked at over 31,000 women in which uh, 8,000, over 8,000 of the women developed cancer. For every unit that was increased uh, in the healthy index, in other words, how many habits they followed, which made the, their point total go up in the index, you saw a reduction of 4% in the risk of breast cancer. In a study of Canadian diet and lifestyle and health, they showed similar result of a 3% decrease in risk of, of breast cancer. The Journal of the National Cancer Institute talked about sustained weight loss and the risk of breast cancer in women 50 years and older. This is very interesting findings in this study. The risk of breast cancer was 13% less for women that reduced two to four and a half kilograms of weight. 16% lower for women which were able to lose and maintain four and a half to nine kilograms of body weight. And it went all the way up to 26% lower risk for women that were able to lose and keep the weight off of nine kilograms or more. So in this study, it's obviously very important that in older age women should maintain a healthy weight or be treated to lose weight. You can clearly see the hazard ratio from this study that showed the weight loss and the sustained weight gain. So on the, on the, Inferior part, you can see the nine kilograms, four and a half to nine or two to four and a half. The women that did not modify the weight and the women that gained weight, you can clearly see that the risk increased. The message is very clear. We must treat women uh, and help them to maintain their weight or lose extra weight. This is a research from 2020. Rationale description of a lifestyle intervention program to achieve moderate weight loss in women when metastatic breast cancer. This is part of the Success C study. It's very interesting research, British Medical Journal of Nutrition, Prevention and Health. So, what we were looking at here was uh, lifestyle changes and weight reduction and to change their cancer risk diagnosis. Earlier this year, Jamon College published a research regarding sitting time or leisure time physical activity. In other words, physical activity that was taken during free time and the survival among US cancer survivors. So the conclusions and the relevance of the study was very clear that excess sitting time was associated with high prevalence and highest risk of death from all cancer. So even 
among cancer patients, we need to get them to move because this is so important. Many times we think that cancer patients are very weak and shouldn't be moving and we need to be proactive in getting them to reduce this risk. So you can clearly see that 2018 physical activity guidelines that clearly state that they recommended a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intense aerobic exercise weekly for healthy living can reduce 25% reduced breast cancer risk. How does physical activity reduce risk of cancer? We know that physical activity works on adiposity and on reduction of leptin, overweight or obese individuals, even hyperglycemia patients. We know that, that insulin sensitivity is obviously augmented when physical activity is undertaken. And we see that even in growth factors are reduced and anti-inflammatory factors are increased. You can see the tumor necrosis factor, IL-6 and the CRP are reduced. Steroid hormones are also reduced. And obviously hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, we see a reduction of cortisol and cortico testosterone ratio. So very important to note the relation. When we look at breast cancer specifically, there is strong evidence for decreased risk in post or premenopausal. There is limited evidence regarding sedentary behavior. In obesity, there is strong evidence for increased risk. This is a very important uh, comparison chart because we can also say that when we combine a dose response relationship between breast cancer reduction, strong evidence demonstrates this relationship. It is independent to body mass index. So many times we thought that exercise only worked via body mass, but we could clearly see that it, it is independent of body mass. We published this study in 2010 in Mexico. This was regarding insulin and epileptic levels in obese patients with and without breast cancer. And what we found in the conclusion was that serum leptin levels and leptin and BMI ratio were statistically significant in patients with breast cancer. What we found is that Mexican women that were obese had two to three times higher risk of developing breast cancer as compared to non-obese women. This, this analysis showed that every five kilograms of squared weight, in other words, in the body mass index, every woman that increased five kilograms went and increase their cancer, breast cancer risk of 12% for every five kilograms of body weight. There was a 6% increase of breast cancer on postmenopausal for every 10 centimeters increase of abdominal circumference. If you can see clearly here, this is a group of my patients of breast cancer patients that were part of this study in Mexico. You can clearly see the year that many of them are obese or overweight and diet and physical activity during this research was key for the proliferation of the increase of, of the tumor growth. In closing, I just wanna talk about the current strategies to prevent breast cancer in postmenopausal women. First of all, alcohol consumption or alcohol intake. None or less than one serving per day. You can see, uh, you can see a 13% reduction in risk of 35%. 
So you can clearly see the risk reduction in healthy weight or physical activity. You can see physical activity more than 30 minutes a day, a 20% reduction risk. Hormone replacement therapy should be avoided, which can add, decrease risk from 10 to 50%. So it's very important to personalize the therapy. And obviously uh, different uses of drugs can also reduce risk. In conclusion, cancer is a, a big problem, a huge problem that involves all, all of us. And all of us must participate in its prevention and reduction of risk. The highest frequency in mortality in cancer, we continue to find in low and middle income countries. We must turn towards a model, a health model that finds a balance between prevention and treatment. And obviously health education and medical education in cancer is fundamental. The reduction of personal risk of developing breast cancer with lifestyle medicine is significant as well as in public health policies and should continue to be pushed. And finally, if we do not implement substantial changes in lifestyle, the tsunami, the tidal wave of cancer is going to kill millions of lives. Thank you very much. I wanna take this time to thank uh, my colleagues from the LALMA, Latin American Lifestyle Medicine Associations, and from the Institute of Biomedical Research and Ricardo Palma University. Thank you all. Muchas gracias, Dr. Johnny, por esta brillante exposición que realmente es una de las causas de gran índice de mortalidad y de morbilidad a nivel mundial. No sé si hay alguna pregunta para el Dr. Johnny, por favor, en todos los participantes. Creo que todo ha sido muy bien explicado. Realmente la prevención que tenemos que tener en, este, en esta patología la podemos combatir con lo que es la medicina y estilo de vida. Muy bien explicado. Gracias, doctor Johnny, por su brillante presentación. Agradecemos y tomar las medidas necesarias. Gracias. Ahora presentamos, eh, por favor, al doctor Lujón. Lo dejamos en sala. Gracias. Y un video, ¿verdad? Muy bien, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Voy a, a continuación a presentar al doctor Johan Hannes. Uh, pero creo que la mayoría de la audiencia es, es, habla inglés, ¿no? Así que vamos a hacerlo en, en inglés. It's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Johan Hannes. Dr. Hannes is the Secretary General and member of the European Lifestyle Medicine Organization Board. He also is the founder and director of the European Lifestyle Medicine Certificate. He is a clinical nutritionist, obesity clinic coordinator, and practitioner of lifestyle medicine as multidisciplinary prevention and treatment in a military hospital in Brussels, Belgium. He has medical expertise as a doctor working for different governmental agencies. He's also a clinical sexologist. He is the developer of the concept of sexual health importance in lifestyle medicine. He also holds a master in food science and nutrition, completed with a university clinical nutrition postgraduate program in Belgium. He holds a master in human sexuality and family studies studies completed with a university clinical sexologist postgraduate program in Belgium. He has done training in lifestyle medicine related university postgraduate programs, such introduction in lifestyle medicine in Harvard University, motivational interviewing training in Massachusetts University, exercises medicine in Belgium, 
and culinary medicine at the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston. He is also a polyglot, as he speaks fluently five languages, English, French, Dutch, Romanian, and Hungarian. Thank you very much, Dr. Hannes, for accepting the invitation. The time is yours. Thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation um, and uh, for the invitation. So it's uh, always an honor to be part of, uh, of the uh, events. And then um, it's not the first time and I'm coming back uh, with pleasure to, to work together. Um, and especially in this first, um, first common event between Elmo and uh, Lalma. So my presentation um, of uh, today here in Belgium, it's, it's evening. Uh, it's about uh, sexual health. So more exactly uh, how lifestyle interventions can um, influence, lifestyle factors can influence fertility. And because the time it's uh, short and because it's more about my expertise as I'm working more with male patients, uh, it's about male fertility. Um, I have no conflicts to, uh, of interest to declare. And then what we will, uh, what I will uh, try to, to share uh, tonight. So one is what is sexual health and what we can talk about this in lifestyle medicine, because uh, in a previous uh, also here, you know that uh, we talk about so-called um, sexual scripts. So our education, our um, uh, our culture and so on can uh, affect the way how we look at sexuality and also the sexuality of our patients. Then which are the um, evidence-based lifestyle influencers factors which can influence our sexuality, sexual health. And then uh, finally, uh, when we talk about male infertility, which uh, causes related to lifestyle. So I will not enter in, um, in the hormonal uh, part or genetic disorders that it's uh, for, uh, for the specialist, but I will talk just about the lifestyle factors in a male infertility. So as we know, the, the reference of the World Health Organization in to, a few years ago uh, changed how we look today to the um, sexuality, sexual health. So sexual health today is it's a human right, and it's, in a few words, part of our well-being. Um, at the level of ELMO, of the European Lifestyle Medicine Organization, we had uh, last year uh, published um, a book where I contributed with the sexual health uh, chapter. So there you can see, and you have on the right as well, which are the most important um, factors, what we know today, that influence sexual health. So uh, the age, sleep, stress, addictions, medication, diversity, nutrition, and so on. Uh, we, can, we have this uh, through European Life Science Organization. It's an ebook for those who are interested. I just selected here a few important, which can be eventually helpful in your practice. So um, as I mentioned, age and we have a different sexual health at, uh, or sexual dysfunction at young age or older age. Um, then nutrition, we, we hear today a great uh, um, presentations about Mediterranean diet and uh, also about men importance of menopause, uh, the, uh, breast cancer and so on. So I will not insist on that. Then uh, LGBT community, especially adolescents, they are a special uh, category which we should be uh, careful about uh, suicide possibility and other uh, addictions uh, and addictions. Then smoking, so it's one of the main factors which contributes to sexual dysfunction. Then uh, when we talk about sleep, so obstructive sleep apnea. So in lifestyle medicine, we should always um, investigate, explore to standardize questionnaires, uh, everything about sleep apnea, insomnia. Then we know that shift work disorder, so uh, firemen, health professionals, and so on, they have... Um, um, sec could have 
sexually in women, for example, irregular menstruation or even fertility problems related to uh, shift work um, for those who are working in shifts in the night, especially. And then um, physical activity has a positive influence on erectile dysfunction. We know that six months of uh, uh, aerobic activity regularly minimum uh, four times 40 minutes per week uh, uh, give good um, results. And of course, uh, everything what is about premenopause, menopause, um, so uh, to, to delay osteoporosis, the, the strength exercises are recommended uh, also to, to, to slow down the physiological sarcopenia, physical exercises are recommended and so on. Um, the most Fragment chronic disease where we, um, um, which can play a role on the sexual, uh, sexual health or which can be a cause of sexual dysfunction, it's obesity. I will still come back uh, about uh, the factors which are playing a role uh, in, um, in the male fertility. Then uh, diabetes. So this is one of the main determinant of vascular and microvascular compli complications. So here we talk about cause of sexual uh, uh, dysfunction in men, but not only. Then we have a fatty liver. So was mentioned the importance of the soft drinks, of sugar, uh, uh, sugar beverages. So please, if you have the possibility, limit it, limitate this, even if it's a regular, light or zero uh, version. Then depression. So we all know um, uh, that uh, the pandemic really challenged our mental mental health in uh, Europe. Before pandemic, twenty five percent of uh, population had uh, struggled with anxiety or different uh, levels of uh, depression. And now, after almost three years of uh, um, of pandemic, this doubled. So we have half of the European population uh, which struggles with depression and all with this uh, can cause in everyday life. And then finally, uh, please always, uh, it's important that we check the medication, uh, what we gave to our patient to check if it has not an impact on the sexual, um, sexual health. So for example, an erectile dysfunction, dysfunction, eight of the 12 most prescribed medication could cause erectile dysfunction. And um, here it's uh, the antidepressant can be uh, the medication against high blood pressure uh, and so on. But the idea why, uh, why we are here, it's about a case. So as um, my colleague mentioned very nicely, um, most of my work is related to obesity. So lifestyle intervention, it's obesity and metabolic syndrome, I would uh, say. But lately, since a while, I have more and more professionals turning here in Belgium uh, to me asking for what can I do with some young couples like uh, who we did all the investigation and we found nothing and they cannot, uh, they cannot have a, a baby. So here it's a case, it's a, it's a real, uh, real case of Michael, a 27 years old man, married since three years with Maria. She's more or less his age, so 25 years old. They are a very friendly couple who they have habits what uh, all people of their age going out when was possible, discovering new places to travel. And then they, they felt that since one year they would like to have a baby. But to their surprise, uh, this is not happening. So first uh, they didn't take this too serious, but after some, some months, they, they looked for uh, a professional. So they went to a fertility clinic, but they found nothing abnormal in their um, hormonal or at the spermatoid level. So Michael is an accountant as a job, has gained a lot of weight lately as we many did uh, this pandemic, but he, uh, and you can see this on him because his old clothes are tight on, tighter on him, but he sits a lot uh, do, doing his work. And sometimes in his free time, um, he do some box, but not regularly. 
Um, since a few months, he was promoted in, as a partner in his accountant uh, company. So he has to work more, he's sitting more, he has irregular sleep hours, and uh, he's all the time almost on phone. And trying to relax between uh, 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 during the day, he's smoking um, occasionally. Uh, his wife works with him and she's in charge of uh, most of the administrative part. And uh, she's also influenced by the, the lack of sleep out by his schedule. Um, they don't like to cook too much. So they eat out regularly or friends or family. And then uh, since they have this uh, problem with pregnancy, they start to feel anxious, stress that uh, cause uh, some some conflicts between them. It's also the social pressure, the pressure of the family, what's happening, what's happening. So she started to lose libido and uh, she's really feeling not like a real woman. So I invite you just for yourself and uh, focusing now on, on Michael, what do you think that could be some lifestyle factors based on what you know or what you heard or what you experienced professionally or maybe even yourself that could be the causes or what would you like uh, from lifestyle medicine perspective to investigate, to explore with Michael? So just a few, few seconds, what, what do you think here? You have also some, some factors which um, um, it's obvious that we know can influence fertility. And then I propose you these seven, seven life factors which I identified with him, which can uh, have an influence and we will see how on his uh, fertility. So overweight obesity. So he gained uh, some, some kilos lately, the lack of sleep, uh, heat exposure, so here, as I mentioned, he's sitting a lot. He's wearing tight clothes. Uh, this is when we talk about heat exposure, tobacco. So he's a smoker, even if it's uh, occasionally. Uh, eating a lot out means that we don't have really a control on, on the fat amount and on the salt. And then on, when we are stressed, we are, have more the tendency to, to eat less healthy. So... Uh, uh, that can be also a cause. Then the psychological stress, which is very important because it's one of the main factor which plays a role in um, male infertility. And then radiation. So here he's a lot on the phone. So I am talking about mobile phone. We will see what eventually this can cause. But what is exactly infertility? So um, the World Health Organization defines fertility, infertility like the inability to achieve uh, conception after 12 months of regular sexual intercourse without contraception. Now, um, this is something for, I would say, if the, the woman is younger than 30 years. If it's older than 30 years, 40 years, these 12 months, it's reduced to six months. So, but... Um, this is, I would say, the standard definition when we talk about infertility. Uh, at the European level, in 2019, uh, the total fertility rate was 1.53 live births per woman. So it's a small reduction compared with 2018. And... Um, it's an increase since 2001, but it starts to, to stabilize. Now we have different countries. So one of the most fertile country uh, in Europe, as you can see there with dark, uh, dark orange, uh, it's um, one, it's France. Then you have also Romania, and then you have a bit of orange than uh, those with 153, uh, um, so. I would say that most of Europe, it's somewhere in the middle. Now, when we talk about male infertility, actually, I would say that we have more serious data uh, the late, the last 20 years, because as you probably know, historically speaking, in past, when we talk about infertility, 
uh, men were never been a cause of this. So we always looked at wet women. We know today that this is not the case, but even with this, the most, I would say the two um, medical conditions, which uh, we have most of the studies related to testicle cancer and metabolic syndrome, we have most of the studies related to these uh, two medical conditions like causes of male infertility. Now, I mean, uh, as you saw there, some, some references, uh, we know that um, in the primary cause of infertility, 20% of the, couple, in the couples are male infertility and like a contributor factor male infertility, it's uh, almost half. And then uh, in general population, it's reportedly to have up to 15%. Now, what is also important is that if we have a patient, a male patient with infertility, please be aware that can be also a predictor of other uh, serious medical conditions, especially cardiovascular, metabolic, oncological, and autoimmune disease. Um, I will not insist on this. I was just, it's something what we all learn in medical school. So just uh, that um, the gonadotropine releasing hormone, it's released from hypothalamus in, and influence the pituitary gland, which at, uh, will uh, influence the secretion of uh, luteinizing hormone and folliculitis stimulating hormone. And then these are playing a role in the testosterone secretion and the spermatogenesis, and then how this can influence the link between the testosterone um, and, uh, and the GnRH or the, uh, the two hormones. So as I mentioned, I will not insist on the um, um, hormonal, even if we know today that the causes of male infertility, we could say that they are four. So it's, you have a primary hypogonadism, which includes genetic and uh, development uh, and uh, primary, but also in the secondary hypogonadism, you have genetic and developmental uh, disorders like the klinefelter kalman syndromes, but then you have also acquired disorders. And here it's also uh, integrated the, uh, sperm transport disorders. But when we talk about acquired disorders, we have a varicocell, so it's playing almost uh, 25%. Then we have the reproductive tract uh, obstruction, 15%. Uh, then um, male accessory gland infections, antisperms, antibodies, 10%. Urogenital complications. So here, please, uh, we talk about uh, the mumps um, consequences. Uh, and then together with sexual or ejaculation dysfunction goes up to 2%. So these are the most known and um, studied uh, causes. And then we have those which enter in the category of, of other, or, uh, and here we see unknown origin and unexplained uh, idiopathic, and which are influenced by the environmental agents and lifestyle factors. When we talk about unexplained male infertility, uh, it's when the parameters related to the sperm um, on two or more occasions are normal. And it's also a normal endocrine and physical evaluation. And in the couple, it's the female has no fertility problems. When we talk about idiopathic male infertility, um, some parameters are uh, reduced. I mean, it's uh, the, the number of sperm counts are reduced or um, the, the concentration or so on. So some parameters are modified, but um, all other endocrine or physical evaluation are normal. And in this category, we have also now, we have more and more data and recent data, as you can say from 2019, we have the so-called male oxidative stress infertility, which are um, caused through the sperm DNA fragmentation, seminal oxidative stress. So we have a lot of um, uh, mechanism due to the uh, oxidative stress. Coming back to our patient, to, to Michael, um, these were uh, the, as I mentioned, the categories which I, um, I um, 
identify to him. Obesity. So we know that when we talk about obesity, um, when we talk about mechanism, we have a low grade but chronic systemic inflammation, which uh, which co could be cause of um, poor semen quality, uh, hypogonadism, uh, increased testicular heat, and so on, and also oxidative stress. Um, and then uh, please be also aware that paternal obesity could lead later to pregnancy complication. Uh, so uh, if the, the father has a daughter, uh, uh, obese father has a daughter, so can also uh, lead later on in her life to a pregnancy complication. And uh, of course, sol solution is uh, losing weight. Uh, and doing some nutritional and lifestyle changes, supplementation, axion, axion oxidants, micronutrients, sometimes surgical option. The second factor was the sleep. So those who are sleeping less or are going to late to bedtime, but also those who are sleeping too much, uh, this can influence the uh, sperm quality and can significantly increase the anti-sperms antibodies. So your body uh, produce um, uh, antibodies ag against your own sperm. So then uh, leads to uh, infertility. Then if we don't sleep enough, these are lowering the testosterone levels in younger age, but also in older age. Those, I found a study about uh, use of melatonin for in many countries, it's, uh, uh, it's without prescription. And it seems that six months of use of more than three milligram daily decrease sperm concentration and motility in 25% of, of male. Um, I mentioned that the excessive heat exposure influenced the spermatogenesis and the, um, and the quality of sperm. So what that means, we know today that to, uh, to have the, the best conditions for spermatogenesis, the optimum temperature, it's about two uh, grades Celsius lower than the body temperature. So when we are sitting a lot, when we are working with our laptops on, on, on the genital area, or when we are um, uh, working in a workplace where it's high temperature, or we are taking regularly, hot baths or we have a job that we sit a lot for drivers and so on or very tight underwears and clothes could uh, affect uh, spermatogenesis. When we talk about tobacco, so more than 15 cigarettes per day reduce fecundity. And it's uh, unfortunately proportional with the number uh, of cigarettes per day. Um, it's also important that paternal smoking increase with the risk of genetic disorders also to the, to the baby later on, and even cancer. Then when we talk about nutrition, uh, here um, it's a huge, so that as you can, as you know, probably it's a huge chapter. I, I just uh, found here that, for example, a regular consumption of red meat can influence fertility. Um, it seems one study from 2017 was that increased diary intake could influence, but they, did, they didn't have a threshold there. And if we don't eat in a Mediterranean way, for example, or we missed some, uh, some um, complements there, elements could also influence our, uh, our fertility. And of course, the, which I already mentioned, the high energy sugar beverages, and here we have uh, the total sperm count concentration, motility, and normal morphology. When we talk about radiation, we have a ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. So uh, yeah, we know that uh, unfortunately in testicular cancer, even if we have good results that can have uh, an influence on, um, um, on fertility. And um, even ultrasound, so solar ultrasounds, especially ultraviolet B can cause um, sperm DNA fragmentation and impair sperm function. When we talk about talking at, on, on cell phone, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, um, broadcast antennas, they can lead to deteriorating the semen quality. And finally, um, 
um, the radio frequency what uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, some products can can irradiate these are uh, working on the uh, induction of oxidative stress and alteration uh, of the cell membrane which is influencing of course spermatogenesis and finally the other factors which were not the case in our um, uh, with our uh, patient, but it's still playing a role. So for example, alcohol, especially a chronic heavy, more than 20, 25 units per week. Now, less than five units per week can increase mood. And even if uh, sometimes uh, the quantity of, of semen it's reduced can uh, increase, uh, for example, uh, testosterone level. But it was one or two studies uh, saying this, but chronic and heavy consumption uh, influence negatively fertility, male fertility. Uh, cannabis, so um, marijuana, hashish, so the different type of cannabis uh, on doesn't matter how many cigarettes uh, joints you smoke, they have an influence on the spermatogenesis, on the testosterone level, and they can even influence uh, later the, the health of your of, of the child then non-prescription opioids so that um, and then anabolic steroids or so for those who are uh, doing using regularly so i think it's in a study was mentioned four five percent of the male uh, using these for especially for sport reasons on the long term they can lead to low testosterone level hypogonadism and uh, low spermatogenesis coffee so coffee, it seems uh, coffee, which you caffeine, which we find in coffee, but also especially the sugar rich uh, uh, caffeine beverages would reduce fecundity more than six cups per day. When we talk about endocrine disruptors was a question, um, I think in audience when was the presentation of Dr. Arcadianos. So we know today that endocrine disruptors, when we talk about uh, about diet, it's related to soy, to meat, and um, dairy products. So these we should be aware of which are the origins, and this can be uh, transferred through maternal or via dietary sources. And we have the pesticides, which uh, um, can influence also the fertility. And as I mentioned at the beginning, psychological stress. So that it's a very uh, it's a very big chapter here. Um, please, I would say just from sexual health point of view, don't assume that if a couple wants to have child, the, because of the stress, the, the male uh, partner is not experiencing sexual dysfunction. So as you saw, 2% of the cases could be related to this, but also the, um, how fragrant are the intervaginal uh, 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 intercourse. And these uh, impair the semen parameters and through the main uh, stress hormones. So I would say that we need to get our cholesterol where your sperm count is. Uh, and then I will just finish here inviting you in the ELMO summer edition certificate, which starts in a few, uh, few days. And there we have also a chapter about other aspects of the sexual health. So thank you for, um, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hannes, for this very interesting presentation. I would like to know if there are any questions in the hearing. Someone is asking if the leukemia treatment in adolescents could may uh, cause infertility. It could. So it depends. I mean, as I mentioned, with uh, if radiation it's used, yes, it can cause. Uh, but I don't have much experience with that part. So uh, for me, it sounds logical, but. Um, um, and also some therapy 
That's Dr. Johnny is an oncologist. <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. exactly. <laughs> we have the right person. So uh, thank you. Congratulations for excellent presentations. Um, respecto a los tratamientos oncológicos, específicamente leucemia y otros tumores, los tratamientos en sí mismos como la quimioterapia uh, y la, radio, la radioterapia uh, reducen de manera sustancial eh, la fertilidad. De allí que eh, altas dosis, trasplantes, etc., se hace lo que se llama la preservación de semen en bancos previo al inicio de los tratamientos. De tal manera que durante el tratamiento oncológico es imposible la fecundación y está contraindicado por los efectos teratogénicos y carcinogénicos, pero por supuesto eh, el tratamiento en adolescentes de leucemia y otras patologías eh, tienen un fuerte componente en la reducción y o pérdida. Por ejemplo, en mujeres que reciben tratamiento 30, 40 años, eh, eh, es muy frecuente la menopausia precoz inducen rápidamente la supresión hormonal y la supresión de la fertilidad. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, I think I understand. <laughs> it's close to Latin language. And uh, I see a question also from Cesar Galvez. I don't know if it was for me or for uh, uh, Dr. De La Cruz. It was from a lifestyle medicine perspective, how do you ensure patients will change the behaviors they need to change in order to achieve full cure? Uh, if was For me, I can say that, as we know, I mean, we use mostly motivation interviewing, but not only uh, like a motivational factor, but um, it's the motivation. So the patient wants to have a baby, still wants to have a baby after 12 months. So if yes, we are doing small steps and... Um, It's not so spectacular, I must say, but we know that in lifestyle medicine, it's a long journey. So I, I always say it's minimum six months. If we have results better, I mean, sooner, it's good. But the motivation of the patient is that one which keeps, uh, keeps us going. And anyway, I always say that, uh, and we mentioned somewhere with obese people, it's also the same. We have today, we know, we have obese people who are healthy, is the same here. So all the lifestyle interventions, what we try to work together with the patient, it's for, for, for her, his own health. But as nothing in medicine, it's not 100% sure. So let's work together. And I would say that the only one good, I mean, good thing about pandemic is that people are more aware about their health. So this is what motivates people to, to, to change something because we all had someone or even not ourselves we've been affected and we know today that chronic disease were one of the main factors as a risk for patients with COVID. So motivation. Thank you very much, Dr. Hannes. Thank you. For, for uh, issues with, with the time of the presentations, we need to uh, move for the next presentation. Hi, my name is Johan Hannes. I'm a medical doctor and I'm the director of the European Lifestyle Medicine Certificate. If you would like to know how to apply in practice uh, the lifestyle interventions, and if you would like to be familiarized with other chapters of lifestyle medicine, as how to do um, a medical examination, what you what to ask for in a medical consultation about sexual health and so on, And then if you would like to have also uh, the possibility to connect with other European, but not only lifestyle medicine practitioners, you are invited to be part of the ELMO Lifestyle uh, Medicine Certificate, which uh, will start on 16 May, 2022. Uh, so in a few, a few days, you're welcome to be part of the European lifestyle uh, movement. Doctor Lullón, si me permite, en relación a esa pregunta, me gustaría invitar al doctor Marco Albuja que nos haga un comentario. ¿Cómo asegura que sus pacientes en Ecuador y en Latinoamérica también cumplan con las indicaciones de medicina de, del estilo de vida? Breve, por favor, Marco. 
Queridos amigos de Elmo, un gusto saludarles desde Sudamérica. Yo me encuentro en Quito, Ecuador. Nosotros hacemos medicina estilo de vida hace más o menos cinco años y hemos dividido en dos etapas. Una etapa de ocho semanas, que es la intervención, la parte educativa y la intervención clínica de medicina estilo de vida. Y otra etapa que estamos viendo que es más importante que la primera, la etapa de seguimiento. Porque en etapa de seguimiento nosotros logramos y queremos que nuestros pacientes después de tres años poderles dar el alta. Créanme que es más fácil manejar la etapa de intervención y la etapa de seguimiento sí hay que tener bastante paciencia y ahorita esta etapa es fundamental y hemos creado un equipo para intervención y otro equipo para seguimiento para que los pacientes no declinen o tengan una recaída en sus enfermedades crónicas metabólicas. Perfecto, gracias. Bien amigos, es un gusto seguir con ustedes. Muchísimas gracias por esta confianza a nuestros queridos amigos de ELMO, de la Latino American Lifestyle Medicine Europeo. Para mí es un placer y un gusto eh, presentar un grato amigo nuestro, un miembro de la medicina estilo de vida en Latinoamérica, el doctor Gabriel Lagman. El doctor Gabriel Lagman es nefrólogo y es cardiólogo y es especialista certificado en medicina de estilo de vida. Él es miembro de la Sociedad Argentina de Medicina de Estilo de Vida también. Él es autor de un libro muy interesante que es Reset, justamente este aspecto de seguimiento y los pilares más importantes que nosotros manejamos en Medicina de Estilo de Vida, que es una alimentación saludable, sin productos procesados o mínimamente procesados y alimentos integrales. Otra de las herramientas que él cita en el libro es la higiene del sueño. Otra herramienta es el manejo emocional y la prescripción médica del ejercicio. Aparte de esto, el doctor Gabriel Ladman tiene un posgrado en lípidos y artroesclerosis en el hospital y en el Italian Hospital. Él tiene un posgrado en nutrición eh, vegetariana y vegana de la Universidad de Buenos Aires y algunos otros posgrados más. Para mí es un gusto presentar a Gabriel, que no solo está haciendo medicina estilo de vida, sino está siendo un difusor científico en Buenos Aires, en Argentina, de lo que es medicina de estilo de vida. Es decir, no solo quedarnos en la consulta, sino esto poder expandir y educar a mucho público que necesita saber lo, las, las ventajas y las bondades que tiene la medicina estilo de vida. Dejo con ustedes a nuestro querido doctor Gabriel Alma y vamos a aprender muchas cosas muy interesantes. El tema de él es el impacto de la medicina de estilo de vida en las enfermedades crónicas del riñón. Bienvenido, Gabriel. Un gusto tenerte en esta, en esta ponencia. Mil disculpas, el doctor no puede ingresar. Me está indicando que no, no puede ingresar. No puede iniciar ni el video ni el audio. Me está comunicando por aquí. Si pueden asistirlo, por favor. Así Jason, podemos continuar la interpretación. Eh, okay. Jason, no sé si está Jason por ahí para ver si nos echa una manito. Va, bien, vamos a, a asignarle. Ya debe Muchísimas de tener Gabriel Lama en acceso a la pantalla. Uh -huh. y está en el canal de, de intérprete en español para los que lo van a escuchar en español a ti te escuchamos la traducción perfecto, creo que ya estamos conectados les dejo entonces ahora sí con el doctor Gabriel Adelante. Adman muchísimas gracias Gabriel, adelante por favor ok, perfecto we are going to be translating into English Estamos viendo la pantalla, ¿eh? Ok. Doctor Gabriel Lapman is going to be talking about lifestyle medicine and chronic kidney disease. We're waiting for for the doctor to apparently there is a, a mishap uh, the doctor is apologizing for se escucha Gabriel se escucha perfecto 
he cannot pass on the slides. So let's just wait a second for. Darle click en la diapositiva y ahí vas a poder pasarlo. There it goes. So um, the doctor here is going to be talking about motivation. Yes, and what is the purpose of this presentation and this class? He's going to be talking about the relationship between the different uh, sources of protein. Tal vez, tal vez si te vas a chequear si estás en español o en inglés, chequea en una de las dos que tienes abajo donde dice reacciones o compartir pantalla, tal vez. Estoy en inglés. Yo estoy en inglés. Yo estoy en inglés. Yo aquí estoy en inglés. Eh, we, se escucha perfectamente español, Gabriel, en el canal de español y al del TPT en inglés. Voy a compartir tu presentación. ¿Quieres que la comparta? Dale, dale. A ver, ok. Voy a asistir al doctor, just a second. Fabiola. ¿Me escucha? Ok. Claro. Ok. Well, the doctor was apologizing for the for the inconvenience. Now we are starting back again with a presentation. Um, the presentation is, of course, on lifestyle medicine and chronic kidney disease, and it is by Dr. Gabriel Lapman, nephrologist specialized in cardiology and hypertension. En el área de interpretación, puedes escoger eh, tu traducción o el audio original en donde aparece un planeta okay. I'm in English yo estoy en inglés, ¿verdad? ¿se me oye bien en inglés? abajo en, el, en, el, en tu pantalla de Zoom hay un planeta y ahí en el planeta puedes seleccionar audio original o traducción okay. Hello Do you Can you listen to me? Can you listen to me? Sí, te escuchamos. We hear you. Yes, we, we hear you. Ok, yo no puedo escucharlo a Gabriel. Ese es el problema. I can, I can, I can listen to Gabriel. Mientras tú presentas, puedes bajar tu volumen y ya no escuchas y puedes avanzar esto, Gabriel. Ahí está, perfecto. Ok. Ok. The doctor is apologizing, yes, for the, for the inconvenience. And now we are starting in just a second with a translation, with a proper translation.
So um, why this class? Why having a class on chronic kidney disease in a lifestyle medicine congress? The doctor here explains that the relationship between the sources of proteins and the risk of kidney failure and their progression has been not taken care of during a lot of time. So the purpose of this class is to give you information about this topic through the different data and the different research. Here in this slide, we can see some of the data, yes, a work in fact, that states how chronic kidney disease and the risk of end-stage renal disease opposite death, yes? And the doctor has um, signaled some parts of this, of this work, especially, especially, for example, that in the United States, approximately one in three adults aged 65 years and older have chronic kidney disease defined according to the ratio that is mentioned here in the first paragraph. The majority of the patients with chronic, chronic kidney disease do not progress to advanced stages because death precedes the progression. So death is a, a, a very big factor. What is chronic kidney disease then? Well, the causes, the most frequent causes that produce chronic kidney disease are lupus, environmental factors, chronic pelonephritis, chronic glomerulonephritis, different uh, medications, like for example, diuretics, hereditary, um, hereditary factors, different congenital diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and a chronic kidney disease, polycystic kidney disease. In this article, in this original article, what we can see is how the risk of death of cardiovascular events and chronic kidney disease and hospitalization are represented. But how does chronic kidney disease present? Here, this slide, this slide is in English, so we can follow more, much more easily. So how do patients with kidney disease typically present. They come with abnormal laboratory studies. Yes. Um, what do we need to study with a patient with chronic kidney disease? Well, it is important to have a previous diagnosis of kidney disease, a history of symptomat asymptomatic urinary ab abnormalities, history of alterations in urinary frequency or urgency, history of diabetes, history of hypertension, among others. Here in this uh, slide, we can see some different stages of chronic kidney disease and a classification of kidney disease according to the ratio KDOQI from the 2002. And we can see different stages, one, two, three, three A, three B, four, and then dialysis or renal replacement therapy, yes, in stage number five. What the doctor is explaining is that there is an evolution. Yes, starts with stage number one with normal, chronic, with normal kidney function, but then we start seeing building of this disease. How are diabetes and a hypertension related? In fact, diabetes and hypertension are the two of the most important causes of chronic kidney disease. What, what is the role of a lifestyle, healthy lifestyle and mortality in chronic kidney disease? Having a strong adherence to a healthy lifestyle can cause less mortality and make life span longer, especially in patients with chronic kidney disease. They are, patients are going to live longer. They are not going to die adhering to a healthy lifestyle and different measures. Well, in these, two, in these two charts, we can see some of the, for example, the points based in regression coefficients, like here, yes? We can see the numbers 
and the difference in the BMI, physical activity, smoking, healthy eating index score, yes? In this score, the in this score, the, the doctor is explaining how the demographic and the clinical uh, variables start to start to change. Yes, and they have a, a direct effect in healthy lifestyle score quartiles. For example, the age, the sex, the race, the race and ethnicity the different well, annual household income. How is renal insufficiency or kidney failure seen in vegetarian populations? There are numbers, there are number of studies that have demonstrated that there is a less risk in hypertension, diabetes, type, type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. With people following a vegetarian diet, and chronic kidney disease. It is important to have a look at this chart in which we, in which we see how it, for example, the diabetes is lowered, then also hypertension is also lowered if people follow a vegetarian diet. But what is progression and how is the effect of progression of a chronic kidney disease if someone follows a plant-based nutrition? Different studies have demonstrated that plant-based nutrition is associated with, a, with less risk factors, especially in the progression of the chronic kidney disease. As for example, in the case of hypertension. Because this lifestyle intervention, especially plant-based nutrition, generates prevention, prevention in the development of metabolic syndromes. So one can speculate about the benefit, the potential benefit of plant-based nutrition with chronic kidney disease patients, yes? As it reduces the metabolic syndrome factors it can also be associated with a progression of the benefits, yes, in, the, uh, in this case. And what happens with vegetarian diets and blood pressure? Here the doctor presents to us a meta-analysis. When you follow a plant-based nutrition, a plant-based nutrition lifestyle, your blood pressure is going to lower. And then that is one of the risk factors for developing chronic kidney disease. So there is a direct association between plant-based nutrition, re reduction in blood pressure, and also reduction in the progression of chronic kidney disease. The doctor is explaining here that the key to, to achieve this result is the consumption of fiber. Why does uh, blood pressure get lower in people following a plant-based nutrition? Uh, you can read in the slide that the results account for lower blood pressure in vegetarian, in vegetarians since Numerous observational studies and clinical trials have shown that blood pressure is directly associated with weight. So then dietary data from different studies have shown that the calorie intake of vegetarians is lower and therefore the blood pressure gets lower. Also, sodium intake in the studies like Adventists do show better benefits for people with chronic kidney disease and following a plant-based nutrition. In stages four and five, the sodium in the potassium intake has to be less than 4.7 grams 
daily. Um, the causes of hyperkalemia can be associ associated also with um, the decrease of the FG, all the medications that have to do with um, painkillers, etc. In this slide, the doctor makes uh, a point in incorporating more fiber into the diet. Dietary fiber intake is key, key to um, reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease. What about fats? Vegetarians eat more, more type of fats, more type of healthy fats because they are polysaturated fats, contrary to omnivores that eat a lot of fats, but they are saturated fats. There is a hypothesis that um, points to lipid nephrotoxicity. And this hypothesis is seen in the following chart, the chart that is sharing Dr. Lachman. This lipemia is associated with essential expansion, inflammatory stress, stress in general. So this hy hypothesis is, is true and is, it was validated. Um, the doctor is saying that he's running short of time, so he's going to talk about carbohydrates. Um, the doctor is explaining that replacing carbohydrates for proteins or fats, uh, plant-based fats, could, uh, could have a um, certain benefit. So he says, well, no meat, no meat, there is no problem. If we are, we are going to replace meat, what well, protein is in everything, even in fruit. And here he's sharing two pictures, two images, where we see that there is protein in apples, in bananas, in broccoli, in chickpeas, etc. So, so we need we need to talk about the uh, advantages of following a plant-based nutrition. Here in this slide, the doctor is sharing with us some advantages and some drawbacks in patients with chronic kidney diseases, yes? He is pointing here some of the, some of the relevant association between diabetes and metabolic uh, syndrome, yes? And the prevalence of type two, type two diabetes for non-vegetarians, vegetarians, and uh, um, vegans. There is um, some factors that talk about and they, they reflect to the progression of the chronic kidney disease. Some of them are the uremic toxins, especially the TMAO, TMAO that as we can as we can see here in this, this chart, they have special um, special effect in the microbiota and it has to do it, it is specifically related to the type of food that we eat in meat yes that has carnitine and choline mm -hmm. some of the clinical effects are of course the chronic kidney disease progression and a progression of type 2 diabetes metabolic syndrome heart attack and arteriosclerosis the doctor is explaining that the diseases, the different diseases and these clinical effects are built through time. And they are all based on the same origin, lifestyle medicine intervention. If we don't, if we don't close the tap, then we are going to be not, not going to be able to stop what builds the diseases. Some of the pro factors that make it easier for chronic disease to develop are ox oxidative stress, hyperfofatemia, metabolic acidosis. The doctor is making a point here that we have to point to a preventive medicine to close the tap because all these factors, oxidative stress, 
hyperphosphatemia and uh, metabolic acidosis, they build on the disease. In this, in this slide, the doctor is uh, signaling a breakthrough uh, research talking about the associations of plant protein intake with all cause mortality in chronic kidney disease. And as you may read over there in the slide, in conclusion, this study suggests that a higher proportion of protein from plant sources is associated with lower mortality in patients with chronic kidney disease. This is fundamental. This, this data, he, the doctor is signaling that this data is fundamental. He says, for all people involved in the treatment of chronic kidney disease, he's pointing out that if you change 33% plant of total protein ratio is associated with a lower risk in mortality. So changing the type of protein is fundamental. Hmm? Here in this uh, research, the doctor is also making a point of the association between the plant-based diets, incident chronic kidney disease, and kidney function decline. He's, he's making a point in this case that those that follow a plant-based nutrition from the previous slides, they have a better outcome than those who don't. Hmm? In this, in this slide, in this slide, the doctor is comparing yes vegetarian uh, eating patients with meat dietary protein source and what happens with the absorption of phosphorus and the homeostasis in chronic kidney disease. Well, the doctor is asking to continue with the next slide. This, this slide is very important. And the doctor explains that this type of diet, plant-based diet that we see over there in the chart is um, low in fat, is low in fat. It has less carbo carbohydrates, especially refined carbohydrates, but it will be high in fiber a better microbiome and microbiota. It is, it is low in proteins, therefore the TMAO ratio is going to be better, mm -hmm. not building onto the chronic kidney disease factors. It will be low in phosphorus, low in the acid load, and low in salt. There is going to be less metabolic syndrome, less insulin resistance, less endothelial dysfunction, less beta cell dysfunction, and less adipose tissue dysfunction. So that kidney is going to function even better. The diet is going to be more alkaline, that is why there's not going to be acidosis in these patients. Less progression in the chronic kidney disease, less cardiovascular complication, less inflammation. And it's going to be a protective lifestyle, protective diet for these kidneys. So more exercise, more sleep or better sleep, connections, social connections, less substances, less toxic substances. Yes. And a purpose of life, plant-based nutrition is going to be beneficial, especially for chronic kidney disease patients. So some of the conclusions. Um, plant-based diets have 
kidney protective effect. And several observational studies have confirmed that healthy dietary patterns, usually rich in fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains, and low in red meat, saturated fat, refined sugars, and processed foods are more protective than usual diets in primary prevention. The doctor is saying that we should aim at having better quality years in our life uh, that will result in a, a better lifestyle throughout. So he's talking about the doctor, he's talking about a life full of sense, but by following this, lifestyle medicine interventions, life would be meaningful. Mm? The doctor is saying that changing into plant-based proteins in chronic kidney disease is going to be truly uh, favorable. Mm? They have better progression, better uh, lifespan. This is so much so that National Kidney uh, Foundation kidney.org uh, he, 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 the doctor is part of Sociedad Argentina de Nefrología the Argentinian Society of Nephrology and SAMED Sociedad Argentina de Medicina de Estilo de Vida Argentine Association of Lifestyle Medicine and they are making a stand of following plant-based nutrition plant-based diet for the protection of the kidney, for kidney health. And they have, they have created kidney, uh, the National Association, uh, the American Association of Kidney, kidney.org has created a special subpage, webpage, explaining the benefits of plant-based diet for kidney health. The doctor is, is explaining that uh, we need to foster on these measures to help patients adhere to this type of uh, lifestyle medicine interventions and this type of diet. Mm. The doctor is asking to, uh, for all of you to follow him in his social networks in Instagram, Labman Lifestyle Medicine, well, his webpage, and he has also some um, video programs. He's thanking everyone now here in the association, in Elmo, in Lalma, everyone that uh, is taking part in this platform. Um, he is thanking also Montemorelos University, Jason, Dr. Jason Aragon, Dr. Fabiola, everyone, Dr. Johnny de la Cruz, everyone here. He is so thankful. And uh, Dr. Gabriel Lapman is now inviting everyone to the Argentinian Congress of Lifestyle Medicine. It's the second uh, International Congress of Lifestyle Medicine that is going to be held in November this year. It is the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th of November. So he invites you all. We expect you all to come to Argentina to visit uh, our country. And he's telling everyone that they are going to have extraordinary plenaries and speakers, uh, international speakers, keynote speakers to, to see you all there and to spread the word of lifestyle medicine in all, all around the world. And he's thanking the Elmo organization. And we hope we hope to be there in Athens, joining you, joining all the all the all the, the group. He's apologizing now for the beginning, but he was excellent well presentation, Gabriel, como siempre. Los aplausos de todos nosotros. Well, the excelente, doctor... excelente. Doctor Nabun García, podemos continuar. Esta tarde me da mucho gusto presentar a un invitado especial, el doctor Edward Phillips, director del Instituto de Medicina de Estilo de Vida de Harvard y fundador también de la colaboración de educación de medicina del estilo de vida. Él 
nos trae una atenta invitación para un evento organizado por la Escuela de Medicina de Harvard. Adelante, doctor Phillips. Good evening uh, from France, where I'm uh, calling to, to everyone. Um, and thank you to the organizers from Elmo and to Lalma. I just wanted to uh, spend a few minutes to invite you to a course that we've run at Harvard Medical School starting way back in 2006. Um, we went, first went to India and then we've run this course in the United States once or twice a year since 2006. The special invitation this year is to have you join us because uh, for the first time ever, we're going to have simultaneous translation into both Spanish and Portuguese for the two day course, this coming up on June 10th and 11th. Uh, we're very excited to spread the word by uh, making it more available to everyone in, uh, who wants to listen in Spanish and Portuguese. Um, I'm here in France having trouble getting myself understood um, in French and I, I, I would prefer <laughs> to have a translator with me. We'll have a translator uh, for you. So it's a, a wonderful opportunity um, there's also an opportunity uh, for, uh, there's another course called Chef Coaching, which takes place on the day before. That will still be in English, but there's a special uh, sessions, five sessions after Chef Coaching. And for the first time, we're going to run those sessions uh, with uh, help in Spanish. So if you're interested in the Chef Coaching, we ask you, we invite you to join us on Thursday, June 9th, and then you can sign up for the Spanish speaking uh, sessions for Beyond the Basics. We're very much interested in reaching out to our colleagues in Central and South America, um, in Europe, um, in, in Brazil and Portugal, in Spain and beyond to uh, share all that uh, we have um, in, in the course. So uh, thank you uh, to Dr. Garcia, uh, to um, my friends at Elmo and Lalma for this opportunity to uh, invite you. If you have questions, I'm here. Otherwise, um, uh, buenas noches <laughs> from all the way from France. Muchas gracias, Dr. Phillips. Muchas gracias. Thank you. So we want to thank uh, Dr. Phillips. Let's listen to a video from Elmo. Can we get the volume on, please? Dear colleagues, ELMO is organizing the fourth European Lifestyle Medicine Congress in Athens. This will be the first live event for our organization after three years. Register in the fourth ELMO Congress and visit the homeland of Hippocrates, the father of medicine. I'm looking forward to meeting you in Athens. Well, we have a, a conference ahead for Elmo in, in Athens, Greece. Let's turn over the time to Dr. Vania Asali. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to introduce you the next speak, Dr. Ubaldi, Dr. Estefania Ubaldi. The, she is the actual current president of Elmo working uh, with atherosclerosis in lipidology, where he got her PhD, and with interest in lifestyle medicine, working for the reduction of chronic diseases in her clinic, and also working and studying with psychology and behavior change to lifestyle and quality of life of her patients. Now she will present to us the, uh, the lecture, 
uh, environmental factors in lifestyle medicine. Thank you very much for your presence here with us, with Lauma Group and Elmo presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vanya. Thank you, really. I'm so happy to be here, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's an honor, and uh, I think it's the right way to do lifestyle medicine, just to, to participate, to organize this meeting. Um, it's the first uh, virtual event in collaboration with Blalma, but not the last. We're going to organize many others, and um, we don't have to forget that lifestyle medicine is medicine, but it's uh, about uh, our lives. And uh, it's a great idea to share our lives, um, especially uh, through continents, different continents and different way of lives. Uh, I'm very happy. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to share the screen uh, if possible. Uh, just let me know if it's OK. OK. Can you see the, the slides? Yes. yes. OK, very good. Thank you very much. So um, tonight, because it's night here in Switzerland, it's, uh, it's uh, 8.30 in the evening. And that's the, the good thing and the, the great thing of the, the possibility to have virtual events. We are all together. Um, in this brief presentation, um, we'll try to uh, talk about an emerging field in lifestyle medicine. Of course, 20 minutes uh, is just the time we, I will have to introduce you the topic. It's a big and big topic in lifestyle medicine. And uh, we are going to see uh, the role of environment in lifestyle medicine. This is these are my disclosures. The idea is to um, raise awareness, um, do raise awareness on the role of environment in lifestyle medicine and on how we can manage environmental factors in the clinical application of lifestyle medicine. Um, I must say that the first slides you will see are not very um, motivating because at the moment, Everything related to environment and to its link to health is a big debate. And uh, we don't have so many data. It's a big debate in, the, um, in everyday life. You know for sure that there is this movement for uh, the climate change. But, you know, it's not so easy. It's not so evident because, for example, we have Greta Thunberg. If we talk about environment factors, um, and, his, and her movement, who is sure that, for example, climate change is due to human um, actions. But we also have other people like eminent scientists, for example, Antonina Zikiki, who says that no, climate change, uh, it might be uh, not due to human beings. So it's a debate. It does mean that we don't have uh, data uh, enough precise data on what's happening uh, in the environment and enough data on what will be the cause, the consequence of environment um, on health. On the other side, we have lifestyle medicine and lifestyle medicine is an emerging field too in medicine. So, okay, it will not be so easy tonight because two emerging fields, but we need to raise awareness on this. We know that there is a relation between environment and lifestyle medicine related disease. We know it, but it's not 100% supported by scientific studies. The problem is that we know this, um, this mechanism are 100% supported by scientific studies, but this one are not. But this one, are not the clinical application is completely uh, it's completely not uh, proved scientific proof uh, by studies uh, by scientific studies uh, in the relation between environment and health. It does mean that uh, we need uh, to do some studies 
uh, looking and researching how environment could cause and in which way it can cause uh, our chronic diseases or life-related diseases. On the other side, it's very important to remember that life science medicine is a discipline where behavior change is fundamental to prevent to treat diseases. So these factors, the environmental factors, must be modifiable. Otherwise, we're not talking of lifestyle medicine. We're talking about environment health, environmental medicine. But environment and lifestyle medicine, it's something different. Because if we practice lifestyle medicine, we must, we must um, talk uh, and we must um, modify the behavior of our, children, our, our patients, or they must modify the behavior to prevent the disease. I just remind you that the more non-modifiable risk factors are age, ethnic background, and family history of disease. We cannot change this one, but theoretically we can change all the other risk factors in lifestyle medicine, modify. So the main issues are, just to start in the presentation. Poor evidences regarding the relation between environment factors and lifestyle related diseases, except for tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. We know for sure that tobacco, alcohol, and drugs are directly linked to the pathogenesis of chronic disease. And we also know that with lifestyle medicine actions, uh, we can prevent and change the behavior of our patient. But if you remember in the 70s, uh, we didn't know that tobacco was an environment risk factor that could cause chronic disease because everybody was smoking in the cinemas, in the bus or whatever. So it takes time. At the moment, for sure, we know that tobacco, alcohol and drugs are implied in the pathogenesis of chronic disease, and we know that lifestyle medicine can have some effects on this. But the, for the other factors, we don't have so many researches. I will give you some example afterwards of the, the other environment factors. And, but most clinical researches at the moment are done on animals and not only in humans. So we don't have enough precise evidences for clinical effects. We have a lack of clinical studies. That's why there is an urgence of creating working groups on this topic for research and a urgence of teaching the basis of environmental medicine for all lifestyle medicine practitioners. Okay, so let's talk about this risky substance that are involved and that a lifestyle medicine practitioner must know. We, we must have the knowledge of this risky substance, even if we don't have so many um, studies at the moment. Tobacco, we already said that we have evidences. Alcohol, we have evidences. And illicit drugs, we have evidences. But there are other chapters. There is outdoor pollution. Big chapter, big chapter sorry, is the indoor pollution. Food pesticides, cosmetics, natural toxic substances, pharmaceutical, all these substances are environment risk factors that could cause chronic disease. Let's start with outdoor pollution. For each factor, I would suggest to see first if there is a link, a scientific link with it, and second, if we can include it in the practice of lifestyle medicine, and so if it is a modifiable factor. Let's start with the difficult one. Outdoor uh, pollution. Is, it, uh, is there a scientific link with health? Well, uh, yes, of course. Uh, in 2018, in Geneva, WHO estimates that around 7 million people die every year from the exposure to fine particles. And I don't know if you knew, or if you remember the case of Ella, the nine-year uh, girl who, um, who died because of air pollution. And in 2020, the court in London found that air pollution made a material contribution to the death. And it, had, it has been recognized by the court. So there is a link and the court now recognizes it and, uh, and we know uh, what's happening. But is it 
a modifiable risk factor? Well, of course, uh, mm, the first uh, answer would be no, of course, no, I cannot do anything on how the pollution, it's not my business. I can do it in my uh, private life, but it will not change. Of course, I can choose um, electric, uh, for example, car, or I can choose my bicycle, but uh, immediately I will not have effects because it will take time. Okay, it's true, but I would like just to, uh, it's interesting just to, um, to bring you here this case that I had. It's just to have an idea that maybe we can change our lifestyle, even if, it seems that it's not possible. I had a, this uh, young patient, young manager, and uh, she's living. She was living in London, um, and uh, she came to me because she wanted to do a nutrigenetic test. So we did a nutrigenetic test, and we found the um, polymorphism on the cytochrome and on the gene of for detoxification. She was not a smoker, so. Uh, I didn't have to motivate her to stop smoking because usually when I found the, let's say, uh, incapacity of detoxifying 100% with the polymorphism of this gene, I, um, I motivate the patient not to smoke. She was not smoking, but she, used, she was using uh, running every day. And uh, when she came to me and we saw the result, I just said, okay, please, um, if you run in, uh, in the town, if you go footing, don't go at the peak of pollution because uh, you metabolize slower the, the toxin. And, uh, and she did. Two years uh, after the test, she called me and she said, doctor, I have a question. I have to move because uh, I changed my job and I have to move. I have to change my, uh, the location of my house. And I found a very nice apartment with garden in the middle of London, in the city center of London. But there is a lot of pollution. And uh, the other option is to find another place outside of London. It's one hour, but it is in the campaign. Well, what should I do? Of course, I don't know what she did, but of course, uh, it would be better to go uh, in the campaign and to avoid um, outdoor pollution. It was just to give you the idea and uh, to let, let us think about it. Because um, yes, we cannot change our pollution, but we can change our behavior. In the pollution, this is a too, too big chapter. Uh, we will do some other webinars, some courses. So I will only uh, give you some tips on this, but is, is there a scientific link with health? Well, burden of disease from household air pollution, it's the synonym of indoor pollution, 3.8 million deaths. So it's absolutely uh, correlated to health. And uh, you can find here the percentage um, of, um, of chronic disease that are attributed to uh, indoor pollution. And uh, uh, please remind that we spend 90% of our lives in door and not outside. So there is a scientific link. And is it a modifiable risk factor? Of course, yes, we can do a lot. And um, as I said, it's not the, the place. We, we, we don't have time to talk about indoor pollution, but uh, we all live in a house. So um, my mission is to raise awareness on this. and. Um, it is the presence of physical, chemical, and biological contaminants in the air of indoor pollution and of indoor. And um, his, uh, here you can have just a, an image, a quick image to have a look of uh, all the toxins that you can have in your house. The sources are, we have many sources and not going to, uh, to see all the, uh, the sources because it's too long. But here you see the carbon monoxide, water pollution, electromagnetic particulate, Wi-Fi, and even candles. Um, now I will show you um, all the, the, the toxin uh, and all the substances that we can find in uh, indoor passive smoke.
humidity, cleaning detergents, cooking, of course, because when we cook, uh, we create, we produce the HCAs, the heterocyclic amines and the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are, they can cause cancer. And the uh, carpets, printers, because of the emission of ozone, paints, paints, we have, please, um, always think of ventilating rooms because we, uh, the problem is that we don't think of ventilating our houses. We do everything just to make everything hermetic, but it's exactly the opposite. We have to ventilate rooms, cabinet and furniture. That's why indoor pollution is a big chapter in environment and in lifestyle medicine, because we can change our behavior on this. Here, once again, electromagnetic Wi-Fi. Uh, if we come back to Wi-Fi, uh, we know we don't have evidences. It's unbelievable, but we don't have at the moment now, today, evidences uh, for the, um, uh, the, the, the consequence of the exposure of Wi-Fi, but, um, but we know that there is probably a link. So where, uh, what can you do in lifestyle medicine for this? You can give advices and advices to your patient, not they don't have to sleep with the uh, mobile in the uh, bedroom. And it has to be switched off. The Wi-Fi has to be switched off during the night, for example. This is lifestyle medicine. Radioactivity, radon, we will talk uh, afterwards of radon, the carbon monoxide and uh, the air quality of our own, a big chapter. Uh, I want to go through because we don't have time. Nutrition. Nutrition, is there a scientific link with health for pesticides, for example? Yes, of course. Is it a modifiable risk factor? It is because we can choose what we eat. And um, I don't know if you will have the occasion to go on the YouTube channel of Elmo. Uh, there is a very nice uh, presentation of Dr. Eleni. Uh, she um, she's an expert of metal, and she was talking about uh, and she's talking about um, the calculation that we have to do when we eat calculation for the picograms and the micrograms of the substance that are in every food that we eat. Please go; it's very interesting. Uh, let's go ahead. Cosmetics. Cosmetics is. Another big chapter, is there a scientific link with health? Uh, is, are there uh, modifiable risk factors? There are, because we can choose the cosmetics. We can choose not to use cosmetics. Are there uh, scientific links? Well, here, once again, just look at the compounds, the chemical compounds that we found that we find in the cosmetics. Just look at the concerns, at the um, at the, the, the disease they can cause, scarlet, formaldehyde, carcinogenic fragrance, the perfume, a terrible perfume, paraben specs, sodium laureate, synthetic color, triclosan, but the American Cancer Society notes that the scientific studies behind this claims expose animals to higher doses than we would normally experience that's a problem. We don't have evidence in humans. We see something interesting afterwards. Natural toxic substances. Is there a scientific link with health modifiable risk factors? Radon is the number one cause of lung cancer and you find it in nature. And uh, you, uh, it is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the world. And uh, you find in, in the soil, it is a natural uh, gas. Just look, you, you, found, you find radon everywhere. How radon gets into your home, here we are. And uh, for this, we have a lot of evidences, unfortunately. Another uh, metal, radioactive uh, metal is polonium, which is natural, you probably know that it can cause poisoning. Um, it's just to show that it's not because it's natural, that is, it is not, uh, that it is safe. And pharmaceutical, scientific liquid health, yes, 
modifiable risk factor, yes. It's an emerging, uh, it's absolutely an emerging, um, uh, an emerging topic. Just look at the webinar uh, in March 2022, uh, uh, which talks about pharmaceutical in the environment. So, very important in environmental, in environmental health and medicine is the principle, uh, the, the definition of the precautionary principle. What does it, what is it, the precautionary principles states that if a product, an action or a policy that has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, protective action should be supported before there is a complete scientific proof of a risk. And we are in this situation because at the moment we don't have complete scientific proof of risk, but in this case, what I suggest is to apply this precautionary principle. If, uh, if we have time, it's very, very uh, quick, uh, short uh, clinical case, just to, uh, to maybe um, uh, raise awareness once again, uh, in that we need to be uh, to be uh, um, uh, careful in our clinical practice and um, and to find to look after uh, the environment risk factor that can uh, cause some problems here is the case for example of uh, um, mrs g she's uh, 57 years old very anxious lady and confused and she said i don't know what i have but i feel strange so she works in the watch industry here in geneva so she's in contact with solvent or whatever. And I decided to do uh, the uh, heavy metals. As you can see, aluminum is very high. So I was sure that it was something related to the solvent. But just to let you know that, I don't know if it's not very, very high, but it is high, it's 10 times, but I don't know if this could uh, justify the symptoms, but I just, uh, found these uh, results. So I was convinced that it was uh, something due to her work. But so I said, okay, let's try to check after your holidays. The one month we check it, oh, sorry, we check it and aluminum was four. So I was really happy because I said it's about it's um, the, the products that you use. Unfortunately, no aluminum in the products. We just called the director. It was something very big, to be honest. And it was August, then we go ahead in October. She worked from August to October and aluminum is very low. So I didn't know, we didn't know where she could have this aluminum. She, she was sure that she didn't have any cosmetic with aluminum or whatever. At the end, we found where we uh, where she took where she, she the source of aluminium in, in her lifestyle because the only thing she changed it and I don't know but I suppose it is the right the right answer the only thing she changed changed it sorry uh, in this month was this and these caps are in aluminium so is it uh, the right answer, the fact is that since the moment she didn't use these caps, she didn't have any aluminium in the urine. A second case is very short and very interesting because I don't have the solution. 80 years old, weight loss, abdominal pain, diarrhea, but very painful and digestive issue, retired. Just look at the arsenic in the urines, but I thought it was a cancer. Uh, it was not a cancer because we did all the investigation, but she has this, this value, it's, it's very, very high. It's much more higher than the biological uh, tolerance. And so I immediately asked her to stop fish because she was eating fish. And uh, after four days stopping fish, uh, uh, 
the, the amount was very high, but reduced. After four days stopping fish, uh, the amount uh, is reduced. After months without fish, she doesn't have arsenic in the urine anymore. Then she started again in March, and we know that uh, the source was fish. And last case, uh, just for your information, we can dose arsenic in fish and in uh, food. Last clinical cases, and this will be my last uh, uh, slides, um, uh, 60 years, 67 years old, Mrs. Uh, uh, no, it's Mrs. E, weight loss, constipation, headaches, at home, um, arsenic is very uh, is high, but lead is high. So I I, I asked her to stop fish, and uh, okay, arsenic disappeared, but lead is high, and lead is uh, and lead was high. So we just um, we just uh, we were wondering where she could take. A lead and she she said well doctor I uh, use the um, the casual the coal wouldn't be wouldn't it be this one so okay let's stop the coal the casual it's a cosmetic and uh, just look at the lead it's now it's half uh, it's four and then stopping completely it's two so it was in the coal okay take on messages and then. Um, I would like just to, uh, to, to, to tell you that there is a link between environment factors and chronic disease, but we do not have enough strong evidence at the moment to provide standard reference values for dosage, duration of exposure and bioavailability. We don't have the reference value. We don't have the reference legislation for indoor pollution. It's a problem because we do the, uh, the test here, but we don't have the reference legislation. And uh, this is a problem, but uh, what is important is that we as lifestyle medicine practitioners must have the basic knowledge to be able to identify these factors, to modify lifestyle in our patients and to be updated on the studies. We need to... Uh, working groups on the topic for research. Uh, the, uh, I would like to finish with the, the other uh, take home message is that environment is part of our lifestyle and that we can choose to change our environment. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't took too much time. No, it, it was a great opportunity for us to learn with you. And I have to thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. I thank think you. you. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi. Okay, I think thank you very much. Uh, you are, you, I'm okay, my phone? Yes? I'm sorry, I'm sorry for if I take. Uh, too much time. It's a big no, no, no problem. It was, it was a brilliant presentation, and Thank you remember me how important is the connection of everything. Lifestyle medicine is about connection, connection with people, with emotion, our group of friends, and our relationship with the environment. So important your uh, speech. Uh, showing us how we can do something in our house, in our place of living. And uh, I want to ask you something that I saw in your curriculum. You uh, did uh, clinical surgery in Bologna, and then you studied atherosclerosis, endothelium, and lifestyle. And you enter in lifestyle medicine and you fall in love about changing life of people and behavior. So important to see your journey and how can we inspire new uh, students, students uh, in this way. Because this way, working with the 
best thing that we can do before we got we get sick is prevention and prevention is working with our genetic information and lifestyle changes thank you so much you did uh, so a, a wonderful presentation for us and we have to thank you for Elmo to be together with us with Lauma. If you have Thanks. some question, please. Uh, I see a question there. Huh. The association between wave exposure and health. At the moment, we are not, we don't have anything solid. How solid from a scientific perspective? I don't, you know, uh, um, when a toxin or a substance is um, solid, when we have a solid evidence, uh, we have to refer to the YARC. It is the uh, international, um, uh, the, the YARC is in, is uh, the, let's say, um, branch of the WHO, which studies uh, the risky substance and is based in uh, Lyon, in France. And um, everything is, we have WHO as reference, uh, as medical doctors for uh, the, this, um, let's say, scientific um, validation uh, of risky substance. We need to see if in the table of the YARC, you are in the group of the risky fat. At the moment, the wave exposure and health is not in the risky group. It's unbelievable, but at the moment it is not. So, but the, the precautionary principle is very important. Even if it's not, but we can imagine and we have a suspicion that it can cause something, then we apply the precautionary principle. And we say, okay, at the moment it's not, but please, be careful, because it was the same for tobacco. Tobacco was exactly the same. Uh, at the, uh, in the six, uh, 30 years ago, no, uh, 50 years ago and uh, 40 years ago, uh, we didn't know the effects of tobacco because everybody could smoke everywhere. So now this after, I think it was, it was after the, the after, in the 70s that the precautionary principle was born. When scientists decided that if there is a doubt, we apply the, the, the precautionary principle. It's very, very important. But at the moment, wave exposure and health, no, we don't have. Yes, and one point is so difficult to see all the things together in our genetic profile to clean all those substances because we have many things together. There is many substance, just, uh, hormone disruptors and everything. It's so difficult to measure and see the quality of the interaction of the pollution of the, our microbiota. Yes, so okay. it's very difficult to study because it's a movement inside our, in our body. It is everything together. And so I think that we have to clean uh, our houses as a proposed and then uh, see what happened. You feel better. Yeah, the precautionary principle itself is exactly this. When you have a doubt, when there is a doubt that it could um, uh, cause a damage to the environment or to the people or to the environment, then we avoid to uh, apply this act, to do this action in waiting for the scientific proof. So it does mean that if we have a proof, a scientific proof, it's okay, we follow this scientific uh, proof, let's say. Uh, but if we don't have at the moment the, the scientific validation, but we have a doubt, so it's a step behind, then this substance, this action, this policy, because it's also uh, the precautionary principle, you can apply it also in the, for policies in the, the government they use it if there is a doubt then you stop you don't do it you remove it 
waiting for the, uh, the validation. The, the simple example is the Wi-Fi. As I told you, even if we don't have at the moment the validation of the link uh, between uh, radiation, Wi-Fi and uh, health, then we apply the precautionary principle and we say, no, no, do not expose people to uh, Wi-Fi. This is, uh, this is very easy to understand. When there is a doubt, not a doubt, a scientific doubt, of course. It's not the mother that don't want to give the, the, the mobile to her children. <laughs> it's, a scientific, uh, it's a scientific doubt and we apply it. You can, you can apply it. And the same for pesticides, it's a little bit different, but um, when you, you, you have to adapt the policies for pesticides, some, of, uh, some or other, if there is a doubt, uh, a government could say, no, this pesticide, no, because we apply the precautionary principle because we have the scientific doubt, even if we don't have the scientific data. Yes, it's the, what Evelyn was asking for you, and then you just answer. Uh, she asked about uh, if we have any doubt, don't do. Stay, exactly. stay with the low exposure, and then you you see after. So thank you so much. Thank you very I much. To, we, we learned a lot. And then I will invite Valeria Brother to be together with the last presentation. Thank you. Doctora Valeria. Como están? Muy buenas tardes. Eh, acá este, pensando. En, en las palabras de la doctora Estefanía, eh, que, que es saludable que es este encuentro ¿no? entre la sociedad europea y la sociedad latinoamericana. Eh, qué privilegio poder estar escuchando estas charlas y potenciando juntos la, la medicina de estilo de vida, ¿no, Johnny? Así es, realmente eh, estamos muy contentos. Felicitaciones a la doctora Estefanía Ubaldi por esta excelente presentación. Eh, así que todos preparados para que en octubre participemos en Atenas del de Congreso e e Europeo, pero ahora me gustaría pedirte, eh, Vale, si, si nos compartes la invitación para el Congreso en Argentina en el mes de noviembre, por favor, adelante. Sí, en noviembre, el 9, 10 y 11 de noviembre vamos a estar... Eh, juntos, la sociedad latinoamericana, la sociedad argentina y este, acá en el Sanatorio Adventista del Plata, en Libertador San Martín, en Entre Ríos, este, invitando a todos a que participen de un evento que es científico y vemos que, que va a estar, este, eh, que va a, tener, va a potenciar mucho el encuentro entre nosotros los latinoamericanos y también la sociedad americana y la sociedad europea de estilo de vida. Let's check the volume, please.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Good. So I have a very short presentation because what I want to share with you this afternoon and evening should not be new. And certainly in lifestyle medicine, when we talk about exercise and physical activity, uh, it's not a matter of knowing, it's a matter of doing. Uh, we, we have quite a bit of evidence. If you look at the field of, of lifestyle medicine, and it goes back thousands of years ago, you will find that physical activity was specifically uh, related to health. What do I mean by this? Uh, well, let's get started on the presentation and I would be glad to share it with you. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Um, let's look at the father of, of modern medicine, Hippocrates and what he said thousands of years ago. All parts of the body which have a function if used in moderation and exercise and labors in which each is accustomed become thereby healthy, well-developed and age more slowly. What a, what a fantastic uh, phrase up to there, but he did not stop there. He said, uh, but if unused and left idle, they become liable to disease, defective in growth and age quickly. How the father of med modern medicine knew this thousands of years ago uh, is amazing in itself. And yet, we continue to see the evidence of this. In recent studies regarding what we call uh, athletes at the master's level, which are what we consider to be older adults, 65 years or older, we can clearly see that exercise uh, impacts as a powerful preservation of muscle mass. You can clearly see here in the uh, three MRI scans that uh, the, this is an MRI of the quadriceps of a 70 year old uh, triathlete. Uh, this in the middle is the 74 year old sedentary man. And what you clearly see here in the center is a condition which we are all too familiar with in the clinical setting, a withered flesh or muscle. We call this condition sarcopenia. And you can clearly see up top with in comparison with a 40 year old athlete. Dr. William Buchan from uh, Scotland uh, wrote about 200 years ago that of all the causes which conspire to render the life of a man short and miserable, none have greater influence than the want of proper exercise. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, when we, when we look at, at miserable conditions and we look at, at the global burden of disease, uh, the Lancet published in 2020 uh, a study which just blew my mind. This was the global estimate, the global burden of disease study regarding rehabilitation. And what they found out was that effectively 2.41 billion people around the world had conditions that would benefit from rehabilitation, contributing to 310 million years lost to disabilities, right? So uh, this number, as you can see, has increased by almost 65% in a matter of 30 years. To estimate the need for rehabilitation, we calculate the prevalence of, and years of life lived with disability of 25 diseases and impairments. And you can clearly see here that chronic degenerative disease, non-transmissible diseases, and their relationship to robbing us not only of years of life, but of quality of life, uh, impact in, in such a way that exercise is a key factor in contributing to either recuperating or, uh, or preventing this, these disabilities. Uh, uh, physical activity has been linked to over 35 uh, chronic disease conditions, impacting each one of our systems in a variety of maladies. 
And as we look at sarcopenia, as we look at muscle strength and muscle mass, we have to ask the question that we asked in the presentation beginning, are we running out of time? And so what, what we need to look at this afternoon, this evening is if we are running out of time, how much time do we have left and how can we stop or help to slow down the time? Well, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, regarding the clinical definition or a clinical study of sarcopenia. However, we must focus on the key uh, muscle mass or, or muscle loss decline in the later years of life, because this is where it appears in most of the clinical studies. Uh, aging is a risk factor for the development uh, of, of many diseases. We know this, right? And we know that uh, among those, you know, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia, life expectancy has certainly increased, but the amount of years we live with these disabilities, as I was stating, is, is robbing us of healthy life. And so aging is associated with a number of physical and, and functional changes, specifically sarcopenia. But we know that sarcopenia can be a reversible condition. And this is where the magic of lifestyle medicine happens. Because we know that physical activity becomes a real poly pill for treating a host of diseases. As the Australian Society for, for Sports Medicine said, exercise provides uh, the greatest therapeutic agent for treating a variety of chronic diseases with one solution, and that is daily movement. And we must start to think, if we're going to look at the process of aging, uh, how can we uh, interrupt this uh, cascade of, of sarcopenia that begins with uh, a host of, of uh, factors associated that are expressed in muscular contraction. In other words, when our muscles contract, we now have data as Dr. Uh, Peterson from uh, the, the University of Copenhagen in, in Denmark stated many years ago that uh, the decesum or the cluster of physical inactivity is really starts at the muscular level. We must start to look at muscle as that one organ in our body that we must try to preserve until our dying day. Because just like we talk about uh, the health of our heart and the health of our liver and the, the health of our stomach, and we must start to think about the health of our muscles. And the health of our muscles can only be uh, achieved if we are exercising. Now, how many of you have sarcopenia? Have you ever stopped to think about this? One of the key uh, tests that we use in the clinic with older adults is the classic 30 second sit and, and rise test. Now this, this is a very simple test. All you have to do is you, we, I already know you know how to sit down because we've been sitting down now for two hours, but can you stand and repeat this movement uh, in a given amount of time? So if we stop to do this test and I, I won't be able to do it right now, but I hope everybody does it at the end. I, I want to, uh, I want to make sure that we know what factors we are looking at. Uh, if you look at age, you have 60 to, to 64 year olds, all the way up to 90 to 94 years of age. And you can clearly see there between men and women that those that cannot do 14 repetitions of, of rising and sitting back down again from a chair are below average and thus are at high risk for already uh, developed sarcopenia in the lower leg musculature where the biggest muscles of our body are. And with women, uh, it's almost the same amount of reps. So you need to do this test tonight or this afternoon after we end this talk, get 30 seconds on your stopwatch and see how many reps you can do. Because even, even when we look at, at the development of, of sarcopenia, we know that we can work to change this condition. We know that a loss of lean body mass is associated with a host of diseases, including decreased immunity, which should scare us a lot, especially in the times we are living right now around the world. How do we keep our immune system healthy? We must preserve muscle mass. Right? Uh, so important is the relationship between physical inactivity and health that there are uh, a number of, of experiments recently 
that have caught the attention of, of the scientific community. One of these that is very interesting, I wanted to share with you this evening, which is bed rest and accelerated aging in relation to musculoskeletal and cardiovascular systems. And what they have uh, looked at in this study is a, is a parallel uh, study between a microgravity environment, bed rest and aging. And you can clearly see here the clinical and the health deficits you have decreased quality of life, increased fatigue, decreased functional performance, cardiovascular markers, you have cardiac atrophy and, 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 and decreased cardiac uh, function or uh, increased car arterial stiffening. Musculoskeletal, you have bone metabolism loss. So what we're basically saying in less clinical terms this evening is that when you look at a heat map of the contracting muscles, uh, you can clearly see that excess sitting or bed rest completely uh, atrophies the lower leg muscles. Now remember, these are the biggest muscles in our body. Uh, if we put this in comparison to a microgravity environment, you know that in the International Space Station, they have a, a quite a big area developed for the gymnasium of these uh, uh, space scientists, these astronauts. Uh, and they have to work out between two to two and a half hours per day, six hours a week. And you can see here the different contraptions that are meant to mimic a gravity environment like we have on Earth. But what they're basically trying to tell us is what we've known for years. A microgravity environment, just like excess sitting time, just like aging, are all responsible for contributing to uh, the disease process. In other words, what we're trying to say is that we need to start looking at the contributors to the aging process of muscle disuse as a preventable reversible factor. Muscle use in the form of resistance ex exercise training has been consistently shown as a feasible and effective means of resistance training for older adults, counteracting muscle weakness and physical frailty. In other words, it isn't that we're running out of time, it's that we've wasted time and we're waiting until too late in life where we're asking all the older adults to start exercising, and they have been, in fact, so sedentary for years that they've developed a host of diseases. So what can we say in closing? You know, there was a study that, that was done several years back in the British Medical Journal regarding uh, walking speed. And as you know, with older adults, uh, uh, gait speed is one of the key factors in independent living and actually being able to, to have quality of life. Uh, they looked at male adults age 70 years or over, and they asked this question uh, longitudinally, how fast these uh, older men walked. And what they came to the conclusion was pretty striking. It said that death preferred walking speed is 0.8 meters per second or about three kilometers per hour under working conditions. None of the men in the study that, that walked above, uh, about 1.4 meters per second or five kilometers per hour died during the study. In other words, uh, and this was later repeated, JAMA uh, published another study regarding men and women and walking speed. There was also a, a, an interesting study in Australia done about this. We know now that, that walking speed is directly related to years lived. And if we start looking at the muscle mass index as a predictor of longevity in older adults, we can clearly see that strength is a clinical marker that we should be using in, in all of our practice. In other words, uh, everybody should have a dynamometer to measure grip strength because it's incredibly easy to, to use this as a vital sign in, in our practice. All of us should be able to measure grip strength of, of our patients and be able to have an idea of just how much muscular weakness there is present. And I wanna encourage you to increase that, the use of this in, in our clinical practice. I wanted to end with, with this study this afternoon because I know it's late in, in Athens and in and, and other parts of Europe where you're watching this, but, but this is a very interesting study. Uh, Jeff Young uh, from the American College of Sports Medicine, who is also the, the uh, director of the research group for physical fitness and rehabilitation for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, shared this uh, in, in, in our group. And, and 
this study is striking, uh, and I want to finish with this this afternoon. In, in a study regarding only peak knee extension strength in men at different ages, in other words, how much weight you could uh, extend your knee, thus engaging your quadriceps in a full flexion, right? They looked at men that started strength training at 20 years of age and men that did not train. So you have two, two sets, right? Men that started training in their younger years don't reach peak strength until after their 30th year, all right? Now, remember, we have studies that show that muscle uh, mass starts to decrease at about 35, 40 years of age, and it decreases a certain percentage every year. But here's what's interesting about this study. If you look at when men reach a peak uh, strength at about 30, they don't really lose strength up until their 60th birthday. So about 30 years of, of strength, and even until on, on their 70th birthday, they've only, they're, they're only at about 75%. So they've only lost about 25%. The decline really starts after 70 years of age to 80. But this is the most interesting part of this. If you, if you continue to strength train, and we talk about only two days a week that you really need to strengthen to preserve strength, you are still stronger at 80 than an untrained male at 20 years of age. It, it's striking for me to see this, this study because when you look at it, you say, are we running out of time? We are not running out of time if we continue to include strength training and exercise in our daily lifestyle practices. We need to talk about this to, to our patients. We need to remind them, but more than all, we need to practice it. Exercise, physical activity are a key part of our lifestyle. They are a key part of lifestyle medicine. They are a potent, adjuvant, therapeutic uh, agent of lifestyle medicine. So I wanna encourage you this evening, this afternoon, that if you haven't started exercising, do not wait until next year. Uh, it, it, do not wait to answer the question, are we running out of time? Even in older adults, we have seen that starting strength training decreases muscle loss, uh, in, increases quality of life. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I wanna know if we can share the video again, the Lama, I don't think it had sound before. Can we see if we can share the videos to see? But thank you all for, for uh, your participation and listening. And I look forward to being able to work with Elmo and Lama. Uh, and I look forward to, to going to Athens, Dr. Arcadianos, in, in October. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Looking forward to meeting you in Athens. Yeah. You and yeah. everybody here at the weekend. Thank you. Excelente, excelente. Eh, gracias, Jason, por la excelente presentación. Queremos ahora agradecer a todos por su asistencia, su participación. De manera especial, queremos dar las gracias al equipo de ELMO, doctora Estefanía Ubaldi, doctor Joannis Arcadianos, doctor Joan Haynes. Eh, thank you eh, very much for this opportunity uh, to work together, uh, Elmo, uh, Lalma, eh, trabajando juntos en Latinoamérica. Y también a cada uno del equipo que estuvo presente para que esto fuera una realidad, el equipo de Montemorelos, Jason, la doctora Fabiola de la Universidad de Baja California eh, y toda la, la Universidad de Entre Ríos, Ecuador. Eh, hemos tenido más de 240, 50 conectados en el Zoom Así que realmente hemos disfrutado esta tarde de unas eh, excelentes presentaciones. Eh, la de Gabriel, eh, por supuesto, la de Jason eh, y, y la de nuestros invitados internacionales. Así que de mi parte, un gran abrazo para todos ustedes y estaremos pronto encontrándonos en los siguientes meetings en Grecia, en, en, en Atenas y también en el mes de noviembre en Argentina en el cuarto Congreso Regional Latinoamericano. Un gran saludo con todos ustedes. Thank you, Jay. Johnny. Thank you all. Thank you, Johannes.
Gracias. Gabriel, un abrazo, Gabriel. Buenas tardes. Gracias. 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 Gracias.